And I think I'm live. Looks like. Hey, everybody. Uh, I started a few minutes early, so I'll probably do some reintroduction right at nine, just in case anybody's waiting right till the dot. But I wanted to get this stream going and kind of just fine tune it, figure out how it's going to work. Uh, this is my first time doing anything like this kind of uh, feels a little bit like some of the interviews I've been doing lately. Uh, what with COVID now, it's it's like all the interviews are, are on Zoom calls. So it's kind of the same thing where you're just preparing the moment before and then start the Zoom call and you got to perform kind of for interviews a lot of the time, it feels like. But I just switched jobs recently, so I, uh, they liked my performance enough to, to offer me something. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, so it looks like I have a... A viewer, a couple viewers, possibly. Hi, viewers. Uh, I'm going to be active in the chat once I uh, figure out how to use it all. Uh, like I said, first time using this. So, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, to talking about uh, my projects and everything. I got some notes prepared. Uh, and, yeah, kind of just, just fine-tuning the experience. Still seems like I'm live. I'm not seeing any uh, stream health concerns which I was having earlier when I tried to do a, a way higher bit rate than uh, my computer could handle. But yeah, it looks like I got a couple people coming in here. Hi, everybody that's coming in. Uh, as I was just saying, if you want to message in the chat, any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free. Uh, I'm going to start in just a minute or two. Just fueling up as well. A little Red Bull Blue. It's uh, quite delicious. Uh, hopefully the audio is working and everything okay. It looks like everything. I'm kind of dialing in this OBS software. It's pretty cool for, uh, I'm gonna try to use it on, on even Zoom calls for work maybe and kind of do a little bit better than just your typical screen share, webcam, that kind of thing. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, this is my first time really using it. So hopefully it's all working okay. Looks to be recording live for two and a half minutes. Yeah, it feels like longer than two and a half minutes. Um, just going to start in another two and a half minutes, actually, at nine o'clock. Get into the introductions and everything. Uh, just give some people that are on the dot, Sally's, if that's the term. I don't think it is. I uh, have to get used to looking around and uh, just explaining what I'm doing and everything so everybody kind of is on the same page with me. But uh, yeah. Wait a little longer here for introductions and get into the motivations of things. Uh, yeah, and actually, just before we start here, I guess I got uh, two minutes. I'll give you guys a little freebie here of information here. Uh, back in the day, back in the, the 1999, I actually uh, had a website called dbcam.com. And uh, if you see here, we go all the way back in the way back machine to 1999. And uh, I was attempting to do essentially what I'm doing now um, 21 years ago, basically. Looks like I had a hit counter. This was a TV image, and archive.org has uh, unfortunately butchered it. But if we view the source here, uh, there we go. There's some proof. There's evidence that uh, that was me. This is a webcam site. Just started up doing well and run by Dustin Brett. Did it do well? I don't think so. No one ever heard about it. So, I uh, used something called SpyCam. I don't even, I'm assuming that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. SpyCam, Windows 95, I guess. No. No, there's a remnant of it there. Windows 98. Yeah. I guess it worked all the way up to XP. Uh, okay. Stream's almost started here. I'm just going to get the right, the relevant page up. Uh, oh, that's, a, that's an old blog post. That's about how often I blog post, by the way. Uh, just kind of find some random ones here, maybe. This is a nice one. Just give me my webcam here. And yeah, it looks like I got a couple people as well. Oh, here's some messages as well. Stream is coming through nicely. Only a little quiet, if anything. Okay. That's some perfectly great feedback there, sir. I'm going to try to adjust the microphone, maybe up the volume a little bit, and... Uh, Maybe I'm talking too quiet as well. Maybe I should start yelling. Is that what you want? No, thanks, man. Very appreciated. 
Oh, this is the guy Meowster Chief. This is a cool guy here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about him in, in a bit. Uh, one of the, he made one of the projects actually that uh, that inspired me. So I'd like to give him a shout out, and I'll give him another one when I get into that. Blue Red Bull, best one. It is the best one. You're right. Uh, Chris, Chris, Christina, simple name. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. That uh, it is the best one. The red one's pretty good too, but uh, yeah, I'm sold on the blue. I like the flavor blue, so it's just uh, yeah. And it's nine o'clock, so I wanted to say uh, thank you for all the people that are here on time. That's the best uh, time to be here is on time. So thank you for coming. Uh, very appreciated. Uh, this is my first stream. Um, sounds like it's coming through loud and clear. Hopefully the audio is a little bit better now. Well, yeah, my name is Dustin Brett uh, from uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, been doing software development for, I guess, seven seven ish years professionally, and uh, software development in general for f nearly twenty years, I guess. Um, but very simple, like HTML, w whatever JavaScript was back in nineteen ninety nine ish. I, I don't even remember, but. That's when I was attempting to tinker with it, and uh, there were a lot of massive breaks in between, so I wouldn't say I've been doing something for 20 years, let's say, but uh, I've definitely put some time in and messed around with a lot of code, and uh, and luckily got a job from it, uh, a couple jobs along the way, so uh, it's it's been a bumpy transition to get there uh, over many different jobs and kind of something I could get into in a, in a future, future one as well, if people are interested. Uh, but yeah, maybe I'll show you guys a couple of my websites here just to get an idea. This is my blog. Uh, did a bunch of traveling a long time ago, uh, so I did uh, quite a few travel blog posts back in the day. But uh, since then, pretty sparse. Once a year posts. Uh, not not great at keeping up the blog, unfortunately. Uh, got a GitHub here, as as developers tend to have. Uh, you can see a lot of activity here. This little, uh, these blips here. That was that was the initial project that uh, that we're going to get into here that I've been working on, that uh, some of you have come here because of, and I uh, appreciate it that. Um, but yeah, it's that's pretty much the the highlight of my GitHub profile right now. I've had it for a while, but uh, I haven't been using it professionally too much. A friend of mine, Daniel, a coworker, kind of told me that yeah, I should start using it more professionally. So I've I've tried to to keep it up and contribute to some repositories, but I've been pretty bad with it. Uh, this is the main project I was talking to you guys about. Got some pretty decent stars. Uh, I, I don't know why they round up 1.3. I'll take it. 1.266. Uh, pretty reasonable. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with the response I got, which is kind of what really motivated me to, to start this because, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to do it again, you know, um, that's um, something I've been thinking about for a while with uh, just coding and getting better at coding in general is, is maybe just doing the same thing again and, and getting a chance to really rethink uh, how I did it and, and different approach. And I saw a podcast from Lex Freeman where he was talking to George, uh, George Hotz, I think is his name, uh, a pretty interesting programmer. And, and he was saying something too, where he was like, I wasn't good, and then I made an app, and then I made it again, and I made it again, and he's like, kind of saying like, that he got better, even though he's just making the same thing or making it in different languages, and that's something I've done in the past as well. I know back in the day I was playing around with like making a, a Trojan horse kind of thing, like I never used it or anything as a virus kind of thing almost, but just for the fun of, of like, well, what do you have to do to hide in the operating system, and then you can mess with the user, and I thought that was pretty fun, and I made that in I think Visual Basic six VB six. And then uh, a couple years later, I ended up rewriting it in, in Delphi or Delphi, or whatever it's called. Um, I barely remember either language. I don't. I'm pretty sure the code was a mess. I do have it somewhere though. I think I I, I called it Nemesis, and I put it on this uh, PlanetSourceCode.com website that unfortunately I think died, and I haven't been able to find uh, a lot of the code that I put on there. Unfortunately, that was before I knew about GitHub. I don't know if GitHub existed back then, but I I didn't know about it. So, say lovey. Um, another rando link, um, just to kind of establish, uh, the person you're listening to, um, just my LinkedIn, you know, uh, I don't know, people use this. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a senior software engineer now. So whatever that means, you know, I've, I've finally, I can put that on LinkedIn. So I think that's, that's all that it means, uh, basically. 
Uh, before that, I was a software developer. I, I prefer the genericness of that title, but uh, it, it comes with less pay typically. So, And here I was lead developer. Um, that was fun, but at a certain point when a company's so small, it's like, what do I want my title to be? So that's what I picked essentially, but it's, but at a certain point, my title was not that. So I earned the right to pick that title, you know, in my own opinion. Um, and yeah, before that, uh, these are the ones where I was doing coding for the last, uh, basically since I've been moved to BC, to British Columbia in Canada. Uh, but before that I was in IT. So um, I did a lot of travel in between there. The, the resume gap. Oh, no, a gap. Um, they're probably bad sometimes, but uh, I didn't have problems with, with having such a large gap. You know, people were just interested for the most part. Um, but yeah, before that, I was in IT for like five or six years, just like fixing computers and stuff, but always trying to find ways to uh, do software in between. And that's kind of what I mentioned in some of these. That's kind of what I try to highlight in LinkedIn. Like, yeah, I fix computers, but I also did this where I you know, developer, developer, this, developer, that kind of thing. Just to sell yourself. Back to this. So yeah, let's get into these uh, inspirational projects that I had because uh, this is what, well, let me, let me half segue there. One second, I'm so thirsty. So yeah, that's me essentially. And then I just wanted to start doing some projects recently, just, uh, I don't know if it was a COVID thing. It was before that actually, because I've been working on, on this idea for a long time of these, like, uh, oh, I want to make an operating system or something. It started as, as a, a portfolio website, actually. It was like, what would be a, a cool portfolio if like, uh, pictures of me were, were like desktop icons, you know? And, and it was like, they were in windows or something like that idea I thought was kind of cool. Uh, almost to, you know, I like I like it when the, the user, like if I was to put it in full screen, they'd be confused, you know, like, I've accomplished something if they're confused, I feel like. So that was some of the initial idea of like, I want to make this so close to to reality that they're not sure, you know, and they're like, well, how, how'd you do this? You know, even though like, it's like, well, I just, I just copied it. You know, it's almost like the old trick where people would do, do like a screenshot and set that as the wallpaper and like close Explorer or something like that. And then it's like, oh, I, why can't I click the icons? You know, just messing with windows type stuff. But that's that kind of inspiration. And then I started looking at other websites like, has anyone done anything like that? And that's where I came up with this one here. This uh, Here's one of the first examples. Let me just load it here. This site here, Aaron OS. Uh, this is by uh, my, uh, I'll call him my friend. We chat a few times. Uh, that's probably presumptuous of me. But uh, this guy, Meowster Chief, who's uh, in the chat uh, earlier. I don't know if, I have no idea how to tell who's who's in right now so i'm not sure if he's still around but let's assume he is and uh this is the site he made which is is a i thought a really cool one and and he's actually had a lot of like uh mentions online for other things too so i was surprised that it's not more popular to be honest but he's been working on a lot i know he's a discord channel and it was just one of these cool ones where it's like where you're a little confused you're like oh, okay what's going on here is this like a computer like is it got my CP cpu he's tracking like what you know I mean, it, it could look like, it's like a version of Linux or something almost, like in a, a pre-Ubuntu or, or one of those like uh, really small ones that you fit on a CD or something like that. So I thought it was cool. I can, let me play around with it a bit here. I don't want to, I'm not going to get too far into it, to be honest, Aaron, because uh, I have no idea. And uh, I played with it a little bit, but uh, I had a few others I wanted to mention too. I don't know where that goes. That, that went into the ether, I guess, or... Or into like a globe, maybe it's like he's got like a back end and stuff too, which is actually something I, I I haven't gotten to yet, but that's cool. Yeah, he's got quite a few. So shout out there, man. I'd call you a friend for sure. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I'll, I'll take it then. Nice. I, I like to, I start as a friend with people, you know, and like just kind of throw myself out there. And it's like, if you, if you like what you see, you know, let's be friends. So I'm glad he liked what he saw. This Windows 93 one, this is insane. Uh, I don't know this guy, but I, I saw, I think an article about it where I think it was like a musician or something. And a lot of the apps are very musical. This one's pretty hardcore, actually. This guy went into a lot of detail. Like it's actually, it's, it's, I mean, Windows 93, it's Windows 93. He can call it whatever he wants. Like this feels like some kind of operating system. I mean, you could, you could run this. And accomplish things. I don't think it has a browser, but I guess it depends what you want to do, you know? 
I mean, if you want to calculate stuff, here's a calculator. And look at this, that Windows transition. He's thought about that kind of stuff, you know? He's got some, you can resize it. Look at that, look at the responsiveness of that beautiful calculator. So he's he's thought it out. And uh, what else has he got here? Half-Life 3, I, I'm doubting that, but let's open it and see what happens. He has a lot of spoofs and pranks on this, but again, there was a cool Windows transition. Crazy, man. I, I th is it like a joke that it takes this long or is something occurring? Well, he's recreated the impatience of Windows, you know? It's like, I'm tired of waiting already. Yeah, I think this is part of the joke. I don't have the patience for this. All right, let me refresh the page. I have a feeling that's not gonna be enough. How do I close this? Oh, that works. It's another nice one here. Here's a detail I feel like he missed. It looks like it's active there, but it is not, you know? You click it, it's like, okay, it's active, but I can't make it unactive. Uh, and in Windows, you could do that. And you could nitpick, I guess, the start. It could be slightly, uh, the text could be a little lower. That gets into, into the more like OS copy ones, which here's another inspiration. Here's the last one I'll mention. I'm gonna move around here. An attempt to get comfortable here. There we go. Hopefully you guys can still hear me okay. Virtual girl. Oh, nice, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. This is uh, a friend of mine, actually, Kevin, a coworker as well, who's uh, in the chat here. Uh, and he's uh, he's got a good point. What is this virtual girl? I forgot about that one. I I've never clicked it. I've always thought, like, what is this? You know, let's check it out. Okay. This is like, uh, what is that, weird science? Potato YT. Let's do it. Okay. Does the weird science thing change? No. Oh, what, is, what did I just do there? He's got all these weird details, you know? It's like, what can I do with this? Whoa. I mean, I guess that's pretty obvious. Okay. So you can drag this off the screen and then you get like a picture of, of, of the virtual girl. So he's got some cool drag and drop features there too. I think like, oh, you can drag drop stuff on. Yeah, this guy's hardcore. Okay, let's check out this potato. Potato YT. Oh, wow. Oh, I guess the YT is YouTube. Okay. This is just a straight up YouTube player he's got in the middle here. Potatoes. Gonna potate. Gonna potate. Let's, let's, let's take a peek. I don't think I can get a takedown notice for this, can I? This seems unlikely. Let's just play a little of it. Okay. All right. I, I, that's, yeah. That's a wild one, yeah. Another cool transition, too. It's different every time, I think, too. Yeah, now it's a wiggle, and then it just slides away. That's crazy. Any other requests for some apps to check out here, guys? There, there's so many. That's This one's one of the best ones, probably, for just messing around. And this is actually one, something I want to recreate with mine, is that I have a few... I, the one I, I made, which I'll show soon, I have a few things like Doom or something on there. And those are fun. And I could actually have a ton of those. Like I could have, because I have a DOS box on there, essentially an emulator for running DOS games. But this guy goes so beyond. I think he made a lot of games though. I, I think in that way, I, I want to work on with the community trying to make it more modular. So someone, maybe we can make it easy to like pull in games from that already exist, you know, or at least make it easy to, to port them to, to my, my OS or whatever, you know, our OS, however, whatever it turns into, you know. I think that's something to that would be fun. They potato potato and all right. Yeah, that's wild. Would, would, were we able to hear that? There was no audio for that. That's weird. Hmm. Or I, I might not have the audio working for some reason. I messed it up, let's say. But let's assume someone was yelling potato in that video. Uh, sub instance of Win93. Yeah, I think you can do like virtual... Um, this is something I definitely could have done with mine too, actually. Someone suggested it when I posted on Reddit is like a virtual box version of your OS. Where is it here? Virtual box. Isn't there some like virtual virtual lot of stuff here? Hmm. Well, I can't find it, but there's a million things. Yeah, there we go. Virtual PC right in the middle. There we go. So now it's like it's like Windows 93 in Windows 93. Oh, and now we get audio too. Is that like the start music? That's nice. 
Nice. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But the original didn't play that. That's interesting. Okay. All right. So yeah, that one could go on forever, honestly. Um, one last one just to mention, just to give him a little shout out, is this OSJS. Another one I don't know. This guy's he slipped an ad in there, but this is where it was like, okay, people are doing a bit more legit. Like this one's, he's mostly tried to make it almost like a Linux OS, and he has some, he has quite a community that actually adds stuff too, as well. So he's got some decently legit apps. His calc's a little more responsive, if if that's the measurement of a good one of these. If so, I have no calc at all. So some good transparency there. He's thought some stuff out. He's got, he's got the proper active one. Can you unactive it? No. I like to be able to unactive stuff or like to, to go away from it, you know? There's no reason to do it, but I, I like to I like to say nothing selected, you know? Can't do that with this. So unless you close every every oh no, if you close it, then there we go. But if I click one, can't unclick it, yeah. That's a that's a nitpick one there. Okay, so Netscape Navigator just endlessly plays the modem dial-up sound. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have that. You know, he has some he has some wild wave stuff in there. So just to dig back into him one more time, a peek. We, we can come back to this guy a few times too because every time you could open it, it's something else. You know, like what is Poke Glitch? Let's just give one more go. Oh, okay. Oh, it's glitchy. Just a just a glitchy version of, of like a Pokemon game? Hmm. Hey, why not? You know? Okay. Well, that's the kind of thing I want people to be able to add to mine. That kind of arbitrariness, if that's a word. It's probably not. So let's move on to my project quick, just to, just to give it a, a little shout out of its own. Oh, this is just the GitHub repo again. We've been there. So this is a demo of as far as I got before I decided let's redo it all, essentially. Um, so as you see, I had like a nice little transition there. I got the wall, this wallpaper here, which uh, is actually interesting because it's it's like from a different library. And I found out after the fact that this is also used in, in Wallpaper Engine, if you guys know that one, which is something you can get on um, on Steam or somewhere. But it's like used on win for Windows wallpapers. So theoretically, people do have a wallpaper very similar to that, some people. So that's a nice little emulation, especially for someone who happened to have that wallpaper. And and I've got a lot of stuff in here. I mean, we could go over this. I think we'll get into this as we're recreating it because there's a lot of stuff here and I can get into some more details about some of the stuff I did, but I, I definitely tried to recreate a bit. You know, I used some libs. I got icons that can drag, you know, I've, I've emulated a bit of the hovering effects with windows, the deselect that I love, you know, oh, I have deselected it. I can't arrange icons. That's something I like. You know, once they're unarranged, you basically have to refresh if you want them arranged again. And uh, thanks, thank uh, Chris Christina. Well, I'm not sure which one you're saying dope, but I'll assume it's uh, it's mine and say thank you. Uh, and if it's not yours, then uh, I'll, I'll say thank you for the for the other people that uh, I'm sure appreciate it, like Aaron as well. Um, yeah, I have some one in here. So again, like so, I have the Doom one. This is where it's like, oh, I could have so many more of these. I don't know how loud this is going to be. Oh, it's inaudible. Okay, I think I have it muted. Let's see how loud it is when I unmute it. Still, oh, why can't I unmute it? Unmute site. No, all right. Not necessary anyway, so. But you get the idea. This is actually a pretty clean running version of Doom, uh, as you can see. And it's actually pretty fun. And I updated the JS DOS version, so it actually doesn't. Uh, before it was bugging out if you were like pressing the arrow and a button at the same time, that was triggering like uh, certain keyboard shortcuts. And it seems like they fixed that, so it's appreciative because I, I definitely can't write my own DOS emulator from scratch. Uh, I don't think. And uh, not that JS DOS did. I, I believe he took DOS box and uh, using like uh, I think it's mscripten. I believe it's called mscripten, something of that nature. M script here we go M script and use something uh, a tool of this nature to ma essentially make a WebAssembly uh, version of a DOS box that could be used in the browser, and that's what I'm leveraging here essentially, and uh, and it works quite well. And version seven also had web workers, so this helped a lot. Like if you see, I open the taskbar, those load reasonably fast, and if I click and close, they they stay loaded. Uh, in version six, it, that was like a blocking operation, and it was always this was just slowing it down and this, these would load slow every time. So 
it's it's nice to have this and uh, working. And there's also a DOS version as uh, version as well. I mean, this is a DOS box, so this is essentially just DOS without loading anything. And I think if you do help, you can kind of see that it's a uh, maybe yeah DOS box version JS DOS. So. But it essentially is DOS. You can do some stuff in it. Um, I think some stuff does not work. But uh, I think if you go into this directory, I think it even crashes it. Yeah. But but other than that, it works decent. Um, for the games and stuff, yeah, they work good. And uh, and then I worked on, on kind of these window animations. If you see here, so when I full screen it, it, it kind of resizes with it. Uh, and this also works if flip orientation. One thing is, that unfortunately, it doesn't work with touch control, so it's cool on mobile and it actually renders decent, but you can't do anything with it. So, uh, but on desktop you can with the keyboard. Um, other the transitions, yeah, minimize and maximize. I kind of tried to make it a little bit like Mac for the win for the window parts. Uh, minimize as well. I have it minimized to the taskbar item, and if you close it, it'll actually close to the thing that opened it. In this case, that icon. So same with this explorer here. It opens and closes from the same thing. And I tried to make it so you can resize it like you could resize a normal window and uh, even the same cursor as well, not just not a generic one. I tried to copy the fonts a lot here as well. And uh, the task, the start menu, taskbar. A lot of these hover effects were kind of tricky, these blur effects. It'll be fun to, to get into these because these caught, took me a lot of work actually. And, and I'm not super happy with the solution on certain browsers. It kind of messes things up, but it's actually kind of hard to do several backdrop filters over top of each other. So, um, if they're children of each other, so that it's a bit tricky to do that in one component, but I found a way using, I don't even remember, but I'd like us to reapproach that anyways, when, if we get to the, the start menu video, whenever that is, so that'll be something we can figure out together, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically mine. And then moving on, uh, I'd like to talk about the goals of, of this this stream, this specific one. First goal being that I'd like to do one every Saturday, FYI, same time. So hopefully this one goes well, and hopefully there's another one next week for you guys to check out if you want. Uh, and I'm just going to keep progressing this project, and it's going to be a... I'm not going to do it behind your back or anything like that. You know, we're going to do it together. So... Hopefully it'll be fun. I think during the week I, I might take the streams and try to chop out little bits if I can into videos. Like we'll, we'll see once I get along and, and how it works, but I'm hoping that if I explain one thing, I can kind of make a video from that rather than having to just redo it. So we'll see how that works. Um, so yeah, let's get into the project goals. I'm going to show you guys. Uh, no, I'll just list them. I have them written down, but I'll just tell you guys. Don't worry. Trust me. So first thing that's important to me is teaching others how to make this project, which is kind of what I've been saying is like people that are watching the stream now, the people that will watch it later, um, just to get an idea for, for how you could make a project like this and, and going right from, from step one. Like even if you see a lot of tutorials, they'll be, they're already in the repo. They're already, they're doing this, they, they're not doing commits, you know, like I want to, you're, you're going to make this with me the whole way through. So I'm not going to just slide in. Oh, here's some code I, I pre-made, you know? Uh, no, we're, we're gonna, you know, have the flour and the dough or you know, whatever the, the, the euphemism is for, for that. We're, we're going to do it together, you know, from the, from scratch as I've written in my notes, that's important. So there's a few videos out there doing that, but, uh, I, I'm going to try to make it different wherever I can, you know, that's another goal of this, of my videos is I don't want them to be, if you can find my content better somewhere else or like the same, what's trying to be discussed, you know, you should go that to those people, I, I'm trying to tr put something new in there, which I don't know what it is yet, but m maybe it'll be this project, who knows, but I might make other videos uh, separate from this project, we'll see. Second goal of this project, um, following these open source processes that I'm mentioning, uh, I was pretty bad for commits, PRs, non-existent, uh, the issues have only just recently cropped up, even though I've known about them, I've just been putting them in a readme. Uh, and even a CI process, a continuous integration, uh, continuous deployment type process. I know GitHub has a lot of that. Uh, I have experience with that professionally, like uh, with GitLab CI or uh, what was it? Travis CI was another one that we've used. Uh, I've used several professionally, but I've never seen what the open source community has. And I've always kind of just like, I'll, I'll just GitHub is just a place I dump stuff. But 
but I know that they, they've been working hard on it. So I'd like to get into that and even get into more of the, the public Travis stuff and, uh, or just whatever CI tools we decide to use, wh whichever ones make sense. I mean, that's something we can even research together. That's for another video as well. But, but that process, so people see like, oh, okay, this is, this is how it actually works, you know, instead of just somebody kind of pre-baking stuff again. Um, another one is, uh, discovering best practices and ideal ways to do things. Uh, I say discovering there because I don't want to be like, what's the best practice? And then just do that. Um, I mean, we can, that could be a good starting point, but I think we need to justify all the things we do in this project. And that's, that was my goal the first time. And I, I decently hit some of the mark in some places, I think like I'm, I'm who knows? I mean, uh, no one really, uh, judged my code. You know, I never did any PRs, like I say, but, uh, compared to other repositories, it seems similar, you know? So that's where we have to try to figure this out together. And I think that's, it'll be good to, sh to show that process to show that like some, how do you know that like your code's good, you know, and, and a best practice, what does that mean? You know, uh, I don't have the answers, but I think if, if we, we find a best practice and we kind of pick it apart, we'll, we'll kind of, maybe it'll make sense, you know, and it's like, oh, I see why that would be the ideal way to do that. You know, that's, that would be a hope. Uh, and then as, as to why I'm redoing the project, I mentioned a little bit about doing it again and again with the George Hotz quotes and stuff like that. But uh, I do want to improve on my design in a few places. Uh, and I can mention a few, like I think the way I was handling a process, essentially it was just making those that window or, or it, it was all linked to a window. So this is something my, my friend mentioned to me just the other day where he was he was asking like how I was handling processes. And I realized I wasn't I'm not doing it like windows. And it's like, why, why am I not doing that like windows? Because that's a more interesting task, you know, that's harder and it's more fun probably. And then if, if, and once people are playing with it, it'll be more realistic and more familiar to them. So like, even like the, let's say the, the task bar or the desktop icons, I'm just loading those hard coding those as components. But you know, if I had like a component loader as like the process manager, then those could load after the fact, uh, which is how Windows works. Like if you go into your task manager and kill Explorer, your taskbar and your icons disappear. Y your Windows doesn't just die. So I need to separate that stuff, I think, if I want to stay true to, to Windows. And and I, f I also feel like if, if I just keep ex abstracting those ideas out and trying to make them as basic as possible, maybe I'll just have, it'll just build such a great structure in the end that all of a sudden I'll be able to do things. And, and that's what I noticed with my project a little bit is once I started, once I had the window thing, right. And once I had the task bar and everything, then the, the components, the apps or whatever you want to call them became quite easy to write. And then once I'd had one, it's like, oh, wow, this, this feels better or this, this makes more sense now. And it, it wasn't so separate from, from the idea once you have that, that base, you know? So that's where I want to clean up the processes logic styled components. Uh, I, I kept humming and hawing about it and never did it. But they seem, I just, they just seem cool. Everybody keeps saying they're cool. I think they're cool. It's maybe one of those best, is this a best practice thing that we need to figure out? So that'll be something to dive into. And, and then and connected with that is having some kind of theming system. Because as you can see, my theme currently is like Windows taskbar, Windows desktop icon style, but the windows are like more Mac OS. I thought that was kind of fun because I get to copy both. I no longer have a Mac. So it's a little hard for me to do as good a copy. I'm probably going to just go straight Windows 10 this time and just try to be really straight on that. But I want the theming engine or whatever, the theming system to allow this mix and match again so that after I get the Windows 10 solid, I can come back and I can make a Mac version and I can also make a, a hybrid like what I have now or I could flip it where where it's like the, the Mac OS dock or something or I, I don't know how it'll work, you know, but that's part of the idea. Just reading a chat here from from the Meowster chief himself. Uh, very similar cases for this, this is another note for the stream, by the way. I, I'm hoping at one point to be able to put like a chat message just in there. I haven't figured that out yet. I can do the entire chat, but I kind of just want to highlight chats and be like, oh, this is interesting because I don't want it to dominate the stream. And and like I said, if I want to chop up videos to, maybe for later, I'd rather there not be like chats that are very contextual to the stream in there. So. I, I will integrate chat more in the future, just so you guys know, hopefully with these like a little bubble of like what he said, but for now, I'm just going to read it. Okay. Very similar cases for my project in terms of structure and the way things are held together. You won't be the only one learning things. Nice by the sound of it. Cool. Cool. 
yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that people can are learning something from this because like, uh, I, again, my friend the other day was telling me that, that he thought he would learn from this. And I was like, uh, I actually held my friend in high regard as far as developers go. So it's like, hmm, how is he learning from me? Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta step up my game if he thinks he's gonna learn something from me. And I don't think it's gonna be this stream necessarily, perhaps, but we're not gonna get too advanced here. We're mostly just gonna talk about the ideas and then kind of do a bit of setup is my plan. So we'll see, we'll see. But I'm hoping to stay consistent. So hopefully in the future streams, we can get advanced and maybe I'll, maybe you will learn something from me. You never know. So that's my idea for theming. Um, more tests, more hooks, more abstraction. Um, I only kind of, I kind of like refigured out hooks halfway through the project where I was like, oh, this, this can be a hook, that can be a hook. Uh, and then I just started turning everything into hooks and, and it actually really worked out quite well. And, and this was part of like a larger idea of, of abstraction that I think will be good for our, the stream as well is people are always talking about, oh, I, I come into a stream and I don't know what's going on. And it's like, well, maybe that's the problem with the code. You know, if you can't, if you look at code and it's like, what the hell is this? Where is this coming from? It's like, well, maybe the folder structure should be better. Or maybe the, the variables names aren't proper. Like maybe you, you should be able to just look at it, you know? And that's what's something with, with hooks where it was really like for DOS, I ended up going just use DOS and, and throwing a container in there. And it's like, it's like you could just come into a stream and know that like, and, and, I mean, you have to have a little context to know that we're working on this JS DOS thing maybe, but at least you're like, oh, okay. You know, if you have that bit of context, there's only one line, you know? And it's like, we can dig into the hook if you want. And that also should be small, I feel, and also very abstracted out so that we're, so that people, I mean, this isn't just a stream thing. This is an in general thing where that's a problem where, where you jump into code at some point and you're like, what is this? There's just so much going on. This, this function is doing so much or, you know, it's a huge problem in general. So that's, I, I don't want that to happen with my code and that's something we'll work on together that I, I think will be better for the stream and anyways. So the win, 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 win. Uh, news, I could go on forever with all these, what things I want to improve. You know, the shortcuts are a little slow to load because I, I went so far to, to try to make real shortcuts. Like they, they, they're almost like those .lnk files that are part of, of Windows which is essentially just an INI file inside. Um, but it, it like the, essentially the shortcuts on my, on my OS, you could take that file and, and it would work almost as a, as like an internet shortcut in, in windows. I think is it LNK or it's an internet shortcut. So I'm not sure if that's the correct file extension, but I tried to follow this generic format, but it kind of bit me a little bit because now, because they're real files, it's just a bunch of extra network requests that I don't need. So I need some better caching in there or something because the start menu you see there, it's so well, I don't, sorry, let me switch to the thing here. So when we first load the start menu or even these icons here, the, the reason that they come in in that staggered approach is essentially because they're just each loading. They're each like a file. So it, I, at one point I did caching and they kind of just came in as a chunk. So uh, same with the start menu, you see bing, 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 bing. I didn't have an animation there because I, I didn't want people to even think, oh, that's that's animating in, you know? That's why I don't, that's why I don't like that they load that way. So, uh, and then the last note I have is, let me switch back to me again here. Me, more me. Uh, hopefully, yeah, the stream is going okay so far. Cool. Cool. Um, sorry. One last thing is uh, details, details, details. Uh, that's, that's kind of been, uh, something I, I, I want to care about with the project is that is like I said, where I want it to be almost pixel perfect in some ways so that people are properly fooled because. You know, there's, there's those prank websites that you guys might've seen them in the past too. Like kind of like that windows 93, there's actually a lot of them. There's probably like 30 or 40 that I found. And they're not like for someone like me, for, for the, for the discerning OS viewer, uh, it, it's like, okay, this isn't right. You know, for the right away, or it's like, oh, this isn't right. Or they're using Linux and they, they've messed with stuff. Uh, and I, and I want people, I, w I don't, don't want that experience. I want someone to be legitimately tricked, you know, and, and to be able to do a bunch of stuff. And, and like, it's almost like a Turing machine OS. It's like, can you tell if you're in an OS or not? You know, can you tell if you're talking to an OS? So that's a hope. That's a, that's a high hope. I, I think the UI got close in some, some respects. Uh, and the way I made it actually luckily worked well for mobile. So I know when I posted on Reddit, a lot of people were like, oh, wow, it works so good on mobile. And it's like, I didn't make it mobile first, but I made it to work on, on many resolutions and 
the elements really are suited well to to working that way but but surprisingly a lot of people's aren't very mobile friendly and it's hard because those windows to try to drag a window with your finger like it's not quite as easy so i think we've talked i've talked more than enough about introductions project goals that was a big part of it but i, I think it's i think it's time to dig in to the meat of some code and do some initial setup. And I've got a bunch of links that I'm gonna use throughout and then I'm gonna post some notes later and I'll update the description just so you guys know. So don't worry about that. So let's just uh, let's just get into it here. I'm gonna switch to VS Code like so. I've got another little version of my thing. It's it's gonna current, just, uh, yeah, let's just, let's get into it, let's get into it, so. I'm gonna use the existing repo because I like those stars and I don't wanna start a new repo, you know? I wanna just, uh, once this is done, we're just gonna kind of do a switcheroo and this will be version two, I'm gonna call it. So I'm gonna make a branch called version two and I'm just gonna work in that and I'm gonna be a lot more clean about it. Um, so here, yeah, looking at my notes here, um, let's, let's try to start from the start and let's just get into this here. I want to open this to start. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I just got to kind of orient myself as to remembering how I'd like to do it. So yeah, like I said, we want a new branch. Um, I'm still checked out to this branch. I'll show you guys here. Got a just. I, I'm not sure how how basic we want to get as far as talking about certain things, and I can talk more about my setup too at some point. But for now, I'll just say that I'm using VS Code. This is the terminal. Um, if you guys have any questions about any of that stuff, we can get into that, but we won't for now. So I, I had, I had the code running right now. Um, and it's, that's this window to the right of it. Uh, and I'm going to leave that running at the moment. Actually, no, I'm not because I'm going to nuke this branch. So let's do that. So I need to go back into the terminal here and just kill this. Oh, I actually just did kill it. So yeah, that's probably gonna be detrimental to this. There we go. Okay, good. So let's start at that. And we got a branch here. Uh, I'm going to make this bigger. So I'm in the folder right now. Currently, I'm checked out to master. Uh, and I do most of my getting visually, my my git work. I know some people love the, the git CIA commands, CLI. Uh, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. I, I just It's just more to remember for me. I like, press, I like clicking things. So I'm going to do it visually here. I'm going to do it in VS Code, but I also use a program called Fork sometimes. Maybe we'll get into it another day. So... I'm going to switch branches, uh, but I actually haven't made the branch yet. So let's go to this first link here. I'm going to switch back to the browser here to show you guys. Where is the browser? There it is. So yeah, just I'm going to go along the whole process. You know, I mean, maybe this is a little tedious. Tell me if it gets too tedious, but this is how I work. You know, uh, it's like, okay, I want to make a new branch. Let's figure it out. Uh, and without jumping ahead here, basically, I, I just uh, I found it through Stack Overflow. You know, like everything else, get new... Uh, new version, uh, new empty branch, I think is what I typed. Get new empty branch. Got here, create empty branch. You slide down to the first answer. Okay, big a boom. Get checkout orphan and then the name of the branch. Thank you, sir. Um, not to not to just trust Stack Overflow, you know, you don't necessarily want to. So that's why I, I kind of will also check this out. Okay, here's the documentation for get checkout. Uh, and then you, you can dig into the... Well, what does orphan do? You know, just to make sure I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kill my my repo, am I? Uh, and simple simple enough to look it up. If you care to, it's usually in the CLI too. But like I say, I'm, I'm kind of I, I guess I'm about to use it, so I, I take back what I just said about not doing CLI commands. But this is the exception. So create a new orphan branch, named etc., and switch to it. So the orphan branch essentially the first commit made on this branch will have no parents, and the root will be a new history. We're starting fresh, boys and girls. So let's get into it. Get check. What the hell was the command? I already forgot it. Help me stack overflow. Okay, get checkout. I'm just going to copy this. Copy paste is your friend. I actually like it a lot, copy paste, because I don't trust myself to type. So I'll even copy very simple stuff that I probably shouldn't. Um, B2. Have I already made this branch? Let's just call it uh, the redo. Let's call it redo because I don't know if I've made V2, but I'll clean that up later and uh, 
that's some of the extra, the secret sauce I'll do in the background. So let's call it redo. Switch to a new branch, redo. And so the first thing you'll see in VS Code is that it thinks all these files are new and it wants to stage them because they're still there. I didn't delete them. So I'm just going to undo this, get rid of all those files. Uh, and it actually crashed on me. That's unfortunate. I'm just going to do that a different way then here. So we're still in here. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, I think it's it's angry at the node modules folder being deleted. That damn node modules folder is always is always trouble. So I'm just going to delete that the old school way, which is uh, aggressive, but I'm going to just highlight stuff and press delete. Get rid of all those folders. Yeah, that node modules folder. Oh man, that's rough. So, so frustrating, those node modules folders. Let's delete everything but the node modules folder because that's going to take too long. And then I'm just going to try to do it here for this. A little get magic there. And hopefully this is a little bit faster because frustrating thing with Windows, when you just go to through Explorer and press delete, it, it feels the need to count every single file. And I don't know what else it does, but it takes forever to delete things. Has your feed gone blurry? Anyone else? That's a good question. If that's happened to you, Kevin, I wouldn't want that. Perhaps I'm at too small of a text. Could that be a uh, part of the concern? Seems okay on my end. Okay, good. Good. Good to hear. So I think we finally deleted these files. Let's do a little refresh. Okay. We finally have it. Look at that. We got an empty folder. So we can finally move on. So now we have an empty repo. At this point, we could even do, I don't want to do an initial commit at this point. Let's go to the next step. Uh, next thing I want to do, I'm going, I'm going really from the start here and I'm even going to do a, what did I say here? Creating cloning and archiving repositories. Why did I copy this? Oh, this is for a separate thing. No, this isn't actually the first, this is the first thing I want to make. Now that I remember, I wanted to make a readme file. This is just the, let's just start extremely simple. Um, Am I even opened? Maybe I haven't opened the folder. It, it kind of closed itself when I did rough things to it here. There we go. So now we got now we got a nice empty folder here. We can make our readme.markdown. And this will essentially just be the, the file you see at the start. And we'll just say uh, redo of X. We're just going to give it a very basic name just to kind of start. And we're also going to, let's close this folder here. We're also going to do an npm init just to start the, just to get us a package.json file. So that's not probably the command, I guess. That's the command, npm init. Nice, everyone else sees it clear, good to hear. So this is a slightly unnecessary because uh, just to skip ahead by a step, we're gonna use Next.js as our framework. And uh, at the, we're, I'll, I'll talk about why in a minute. But even before we do that, I just like to, to make this package.json file just so that when we make the next, when we initialize next, we can also see the difference just to know what changed. It's unnecessary, but uh, I don't care. We'll call it 2.0. Description, uh, what did I call the last one? Desktop environment in the browser. That should work. Entry point, not really relevant. Test commands, not relevant. Sure, that's probably correct. Uh, I'm going to take credit for this one, guys, for now. Uh, the license that I decided to use last time was MIT. I'm going to use the same one this time. Uh, we can get into that one as well, into, into which one is best. Uh, I don't know which one's best, but we can, we can get into what the options are anyways. We're not going to get into which one's best because I have no idea. So now we can see it made a package.json file. That's the only other file it made. And if we look at that, we can just see kind of the, the structure of an essentially an, an NPM uh, package file. Pretty much just the, the answers to the things that we uh, written in have written in here. Now we're not gonna have a main, at least I'm not, not, not while I'm in charge, we're not gonna have a main. So I'm just gonna delete that. Uh, the tests, we'll keep that there for now, just, just so that we, we know we're a failure for not having any, but we'll get into that. Um, the repo information, sure, let's keep it here. Keep this here. 
Um, people can find this on their own. I don't like adding that. I don't like adding this either. Um, yeah, we'll keep that stuff to a minimum for now. And that's good enough. So we'll save that. And one other thing I'd like to add to this repository is also a license file because we've already, it was important enough for them to ask us about the license. So let's also add the license file. Uh, and there's that's something we can do in GitHub actually, after we made the repo, there's a very simple way to do it. But I don't know how it works if, if, if it's on a separate branch. So I'm just gonna switch back to my browser here and I'm just gonna thief it from my current code base because it's the exact same file. It's auto-generated from GitHub. It's just called license. Uh, I don't even think it has an extension. So we're just gonna take that and we're just gonna use it just so we have that initial license file. You see my copy paste, I could have just typed the word license, but I don't trust myself. Uh, and then going back here, that was just what I copied there. We wanna also go to the file. No, that's not what I want. I just want the raw file. Here we go, raw file there. And this is the contents of the file. And even to trust myself less, I'm just going to save this to my desktop and just drag it in because I don't even trust myself to copy paste properly, honestly. So I'm just going to rename this. And this has always been my approach and it's probably silly, but it's the least error prone that exists because I just don't trust myself at all ever. And it, it works and it's, it's hell, but uh, it's how I live. So there we go. Oh, 20, the, the, oh, let's switch back here just so we, so we know. So I've copied it over. Sorry to do that in the, the secret background, but it was just a drag drop kind of thing. Um, we have the license, but we can update the copyright. So that always feels good updating copyrights, I think. So we got that. Uh, that's exactly the same file that got generated for me. We got that it matches this. Uh, and we have the readme. Let's even just call the readme. X. I, I just want it to be so basic. You know, I don't want to, let's not add any flair at this point. So th there we have a pretty basic structure for a very, very basic uh, starter package. I don't know what you call that, but it's not too much at this point. Long story short though, I want to commit at this point because I, I want to just get this, this one in the books, you know, and this is, this gets back into the Git side of things. And just, uh, we're leaving a history here of, of, of what's been done and if, if I were to just run next init at this point, it's going to change the package.json file. And I'm not going to know completely how it changed it because I have never, I've never committed the initial version that I have here. So that's something that I want to do more of because there's a lot of like, what the hell did I change? And, and trying to, I, I need to get better with commits. You know, we're going to talk about squashing commits at some point too, where we kind of put a bunch of commits together because again, it's like, I mean, if you look at my commit history for the other repo, it's over 700 and it's a lot of, it's a lot of generic stuff because I just didn't have the patience for it, but we're, we're going to be better this time, you know? So. so let's do one here. So we can do a commit right in the browser. This is how I do it. Or sorry, not the browser in VS code. Um, I typically just do it right from this little source control tab here. And I just say, uh, I'm just going to say initial commit. I'm going to trust myself to spell the word initial. That looks correct. So I'll put capital C too, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's get into that kind of detail, right? Um, so this is good enough. We got the basics. Boom, bing, boom. Commit. Uh, you just press control enter. At this point you have a commit. It's there. And you can see from this little icon at the bottom left of the screen to the, just to the right of redo, this little cloud, that's saying, hey, let's let's send what we have to uh, to the cloud. Essentially, let's press it and hope it works. It might not because I have some problems with my VS Code yet, but let's hope it'll work. It seems to have worked. So at this point now, it's a little sync icon, and if we go to the Git repo that we have, and we switch branches here, and it even says already redo has been pushed, so we know, we know. Let's switch to redo. And now we're switched to it. And yeah, as we see, it's got three very basic things. There's our readme there. Uh, you can see that it, it knows about this license now, possibly because the file's there, I'm not sure, or it might just be because of the way the package.json file is. Uh, clearly the package, I don't know if this is, this isn't package.json file related actually, so never mind that. But anyways, we have the initial thing, so. And now we can see in our commit history, initial commit. 
and we'll and we look and look at the commit and we know forever oh okay that's a pretty basic commit good job that's you didn't do much and that that was what we wanted very clear so if someone was just coming to my stream and to look at that commit it's like you know what's going on because it's simple so let's move on to the next thing the next thing i have in my list is the i've already done npm init so i've skipped ahead of my own list slightly ah git ignore yes i haven't got into git ignore yet but i also haven't installed any packages so let's not do that one just yet uh so let's install our first package with npm and it, Again, this is another thing. I'll get into what NPM is in another. Actually, I'll just slip into it. Why not? Really quickly. So there's something called Node.js. That's uh, basically lets you run JavaScript uh, in the, the command line, kind of. I'm, I'm much oversimplifying it. But it's called Node.js, and NPM is Node Package Manager. So it's essentially like packages for, for working with Node. So you can also see NPM. It's got some website as well. Uh, and they'll have all the packages on there, like like the one I'm about to install, Next.js. Um, no, actually, it's called Next. So let me just uh, get rid of that part there. That's the one, yeah. Next.js, 500,000 downloads. Um, pretty cool. Uh, and so before we get into that, let us, let's talk a little bit about Next.js. Let's get into it a bit. Um, so why did I pick Next.js? Well, there's an, there's some other options. There's another one called Gatsby. That's another one that I considered. Uh, not the great Gatsby, just just the normal one. There we go, Gatsby React, and uh, there it is, Gatsby JS. That's their website. They're not even the first result. That's unfortunate. Or I spelt it wrong, perhaps. One front end to rule them all. That's a nice claim. Yeah, Next.js has a similar one, I believe. Uh, the React framework. They both have very large text. So you should trust both of them essentially. But uh, I really like Next.js. Essentially, it's if you want to use React and you don't want to have to do a bunch of setup, you just want to jump in. It's really good at that. And I actually can't speak too much to Gatsby. I, I read a, I read a bunch of reviews of a bunch of them, and I picked Next.js in the end. But uh, I should probably give Gatsby a fair shake at some point. I'm not going to this time though because uh, I just I really like Next.js. You know, every every time I've seen someone talk about Next.js, they're always talking about how much they like it. So. I think I think it's probably a fine choice, and we'll get into that more. Uh, and then as far as why I'm going with a React framework, uh, well, you know, I, I used Angular in the past. Uh, that's one of the few, the few options. Essentially, these frameworks are, are ways to write uh, JavaScript applications, applications for the web, um, where you can use kind of a, it's just a structured approach, essentially, as opposed to the, the old days where you're kind of, the real wild west where you're just writing JavaScript just raw, you know, even before jQuery, essentially, uh, if people are familiar with jQuery, that's, that's almost like a framework. I, I wouldn't, I, that might be pushing you to call it that. I wouldn't call it that necessarily, but, uh, that kind of held the internet up for a long time and it still is. And it's still quite used at the companies I've worked at. Hi Ezra from the chat, just to say hi to everybody that comes in. I'm much appreciated for having you here. Um, we're just talking about Next.js. We're just setting up a project just to, to kind of refresh everybody in case anyone's new to just coming in. And yeah, we're just kind of talking about the rationale behind why I'm using Next.js, a React framework, rather than something else, let's say an Angular or a Vue. Um, I don't have much experience with Vue, so I, I, I just, I I feel more confident with Angular and with Next.js I just and with React, sorry, because uh, just because of the backing they have, React being run by Facebook, essentially made by Facebook and uh, Angular by uh, Google. So those are the two that I really trust, but the, the Vue.js, Vue I believe it's one guy and he's kind of holding the fort as the, the third guy, as far as I know. Um, but why I chose React, it's just really, I enjoy it. Um, I used Angular and I didn't like the structure of it actually. I, I did it first and I thought, okay, it's opinionated, but I like it. But then after seeing what how it can be with what, with what Next.js has done, and how React can, uh, and getting further into React, JSX. That's that's kind of the, the big part for me because with Angular, you have you have to separate things still. You still have your HTML here. You got your CSS there. Well, CSS aside, you got your HTML here. You got your JavaScript there. And with JSX, you, you can kind of put those two together, and it, it's great, honestly. Like I think I think we're gonna have to get into it. To see, 
at first it kind of sounds silly. And when you look at the JSX code, you're like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. Why are there, why are there these arrow brackets, whatever you call them uh, in my JavaScript code? But eventually you come to appreciate them and, and you, you miss them when they're not there. So, so let's, so long story short, JSX, and, and we'll just quickly look at what JSX is. I'm going to just type it in so I don't have to say it. Uh, JavaScript XML, is that what it stands for? Interesting. Um, introducing JSX, let's just quickly slip into it because this is the selling point for React in my opinion. Is, uh, I mean, just look at this, this alone, if you know JavaScript, essentially this is a variable and then you just put HTML in there. It's like, wait, what, you know? I mean, yeah, you have to pause and think about it. Or at least I just had to, because it actually is quite powerful because this is hello world, but that could be a variable, you know? And this could be dynamic. This could be a, a custom component. This doesn't have to be an H1. You can make your own H1, you know? And it, it's quite flexible. I mean, you can see it kind of being used here. This is like part of the boilerplate that I don't like is where it's like, okay, now I have to render it. I'm dumping it to the DOM. It's like, you don't even need to know that with Next.js. I mean, we'll discuss it and we'll, uh, hopefully I'll discuss it in detail. I might have to go back a few times perhaps if people feel that I can go in more detail with it, but it's it's quite powerful what you can do with it. And I'm not going to go any further with that as far as explaining it because we're just going to dive in because uh, once we initialize the next uh, project, we're going to get some code that we can show you. So let's clear what we have here and let's do the next step. So let's going back to Next.js. Let's uh, let's again do it like like we're just doing it from scratch, you know. So okay, my friend told me about Next.js. Let's figure out how to use it. Start learning. Uh, no, I want to go right into it. Documentation. I'm going to half read the manual here. So set up. That's, that's almost all we need to know. So we can manually set it up by just installing these few things. And that's how minimal it can be. And essentially, and, and we're going to do an initialize, but we're going to shave it back down to almost that because I, I almost prefer that, but I want us to do the initialize just so we can kind of see the, some of the stuff that it puts in there because it's fine, you know? So what does this say? Create next app. Okay. So it's as simple as that. I hope I make it in the right folder. I might have to go back a folder or do some copy paste magic, but let's just try. So let's just run that command that we see here, NP npx create. Uh, very simple, it's like right at the top here, you know? So if I was just coming in hot, that's, that's the command I would run. So let's try it. So we're back here, we paste npmx create next app, and let's see what we get. What is your project named? That's a good question. We've named it X. Yeah, I think it's going to make a folder. We'll, we'll move it out. Yeah, XX. Nice. So just with that, it starts downloading these dependencies, these kind of things you're going to need, but you don't really need to know about, essentially. Uh, it's loading these. This Git repository has too many active changes. No big deal. So it actually just did it right there. Uh, so this is where we get into the git ignore. Let's get right into git ignore because it's trying to suggest that we commit all of these node module changes and that's not good. That's not what we want. So I'm going to show you, we're going to go to the git ignore at this point. And I mean, this is something you could run into if, if you didn't know what you were doing. It's just like, well, if you didn't know what you're doing, you probably would commit those files, but you don't want to essentially. Uh, and there's probably some initialized command that can like make a git ignore file, maybe git init, I don't know. But let's it's not that hard, so we'll just go through it. So a git ignore file basically is just you just put things in there that you don't want to be that you want to be ignored. And uh just to be simplifying it again, I'm gonna copy again from my original project uh the wording at least here. So we'll copy the file. It's called git ignore and we'll just make that file. Let's close the minimize this here. So this is the, so it made its own little XX thing here. Um, we'll put the git ignore file in here, but we're going to dump that in into this in a second. So there's that git ignore file that I've been, I've uh, been telling you about. And all we basically have to do is just say node modules, ignore that. And it, maybe we need a forward slash. I don't know. Let me, what's the original file have in it? Uh, I'm doing a slash in the front. So let's keep that. And let's just be a little preemptive here and also ignore dot next because that's a generated folder that will come when we with next. And we also don't want that. Actually, wait a minute here. Wait a minute here, Dustin. Yeah, get it, get uh, next init actually made a git ignore file for me. So 
I mean, live and learn, you know? Now we just discussed it. We didn't even need to. So let's do that moving of files that I just spoke of so that we actually get the, the power of git ignore properly here because I didn't want to create a folder in a folder. So, oh God, they have the node modules folder again. Let's not copy that. Let's just install that new. And oh, I got to delete this again. RM dir s get rid of this because that is empty now. It just has a node modules folder that we do not want. Okay. So we've cleaned up the project. We got the files in that we wanted. They got created. So we see there's a public folder now, a styles folder, uh, a yarn.lock file. Why are there not a lot of files mentioned here? That's odd. Okay. Oh, is it just still copying? Why is it so slow there? Okay. Well, they're all listed now, but they weren't a second ago. So let's just, let's just not trust that. And look at this. Here's the file structure. So so we got a yarn lock file. I don't have any interest in yarn right now. I'm still an NPM person myself. Uh, those are the two systems, or there might be more, but those are systems for managing packages. I'm going to delete the yarn lock file because we don't need that. We're going to run NPM I again to get the node modules. And I, I think running the NPM version is going to give us a package lock file, which is the NPM version and which is what I prefer. So we're going to run NPM I just to get those dependencies again that I didn't want to copy over so that Windows could count them again. Uh, and while this is happening, we're going to look at that git ignore file that it made. And we see that it's actually made quite an interesting one that already has everything we care about. It's actually got a lot more than I care about, honestly. I'm going to remove a little bit of this because I don't like this boilerplate. And again, I want to simplify it. You know, if someone sees all this, it's like, what is all this? Oh, you have this folder, you have this folder, you have this folder. No, actually, I don't have any of those folders. So when I do, then I'll add this, you know, let's not, let's not get into it yet. It's odd that these have backslashes and this one doesn't. Uh, for consistency, I'm going to remove those. And for being picky, I'm going to alphabetize this here. So LMNO. And when I alphabetize things, I like to do the alphabet in my head because I can't remember the order of letters. I don't know if anyone else has that problem. but So there we go. We got a much more basic git ignore file. And now we can kind of do a little peeking at, at what other folders it's made for us. So it's made three folders, interesting. It's made a styles folder, it's made a public folder, and it's made a pages folder. Uh, okay, cool. Also, it's done some modifications to the package file. Let's let's look at that first, because that was something I was telling you guys about with Git, where we can kind of see the differences now. So now we can see, uh, let me get this out of the way for now and get this out of the way. Now we can see the differences between these two. So you see, it tried to change a bunch of stuff that I don't appreciate, honestly. It's not private. Uh, I like this. It added some scripts. Uh, I like these dependencies. I need those. So you know what? I'm going to take their scripts and their dependencies, and I'm just going to copy those to a new text document here because I like that. The rest, you know, I don't like. It was good the way it was otherwise. So I go into Git here, and I just say, you know, those changes you did to package.json, discard those. Don't need them. And then I'll do that. So... I just want to take uh, the scripts that they had like so, and I'm going to keep test because like I said, that's going to remind us to do tests, I think, having that. And, and here's the dependencies. I'm going to take those and I'm going to put those at the bottom because that's uh, that's just the way it's done, I think. I'm not going to alphabetize this JSON structure. I, I could, you know, if I want to be consistent, but I don't, I, I think people like having the dependencies at the bottom, the scripts here. There's an order to it that's reasonable. That's another something where I can go hardcore with it is like, does it, does it matter? You know, does, oh, repository should be up here or at a certain point, it's like, it is where it is. It, that's where it's been auto-generated. Let's just leave it there. These I alphabetize typically because when you're looking at dependencies, you kind of want to know, does it have React DOM? You know, then I'll go to the R's and I'll find it. So, so this is good. So as you see here, we've got these just three dependencies. It's the same thing that uh, in the instructions they were telling us for Next.js, which was here, it suggested, yeah, next, React, and React DOM. So essentially, that's all that it's done to our package.json file now. And now if we look at the differences, they're more in tune with uh, what we want, which was just adding some scripts and adding these dependencies. But we got to see what it tried to do. And yeah, let's look at the, so we look at the styles here. So do we care about this style? 
Not particularly. I don't want any of this, to be honest. Maybe this boxing size. This is something, this is part of like, oh, what's uh, like normalized CSS and a few other CSS libraries that are supposed to kind of de demessify CSS so that things are more consistent. But that's something we're going to have to dive into to understand more. For now, I'm going to leave that one because I know that, that they put that there for a reason. Uh, I'm not going to presume our link structure is going to not be decorated. I'll, I'll choose that on a per, per component basis. This font family stuff, no, we're going to be pretty strict with fonts, I think. We're going to try to emulate there, so I don't want them setting that. Uh, I like the lack of padding and margin, so I'm going to keep that. So we whittled this down, and a, a little bit later, we're going to change this extension from CSS to SCSS once we add that functionality, and I'll discuss uh, why we would want to, but we won't get to that quite yet. We're going to see what else they've made here. They made a home.module.css. So with Next.js, uh, they're using these, this thing called CSS modules, and this is the structure they like. Uh, I'm thinking of, of maybe re moving the folder structure to keep the, the CSS closer, but also I'm going styled components, I think. So we'll see how much we still rely on CSS modules. I think there could be a hybrid approach where we still could use some. So we'll see on that. Um, for this one here, I don't really care about it. So, I mean, I guess it's good to have a demo a lot of code here. I don't like, I, you know, my demo is just going to be a, a hello world. So I'm not even going to use this. Let's just delete this. So we don't need that file for now. Uh, favicon. Hey, let's use their favicon for now. I don't want this SVG because I'm not going to use their HTML. So we've cut it down already. The styles folder is just those basic globals. The public folder is just an icon so that we have an icon uh, because that's going to give us an, an icon in the browser, which we want. Uh, and also it's going to look for that. The browser looks for that, for the favicon file every time. So you're going to typically get a 404 error if you don't have that. So it's, it's nice practice just to have that. There's, there's a best, best practice for you there. I think is that, uh, you should have your favicon game solid. And there's actually, there's a lot of favicons nowadays. It's not just an, a dot ico file, you know, that's for another talk as well, probably. Uh, so you see here, they're actually using the favicon file there. Uh, I, I'm not going to waste my time being explicit with it at this point because I don't care about this home component. This is the index file. Let's not jump ahead here. Let's, uh, let's get into the basics of next then. So the basics are this, this app file here. I think we need this. I think I tried removing this earlier to see if it would default and it didn't work the way I expected. So let's keep that as it is for now. Uh, but this index file, no, we don't need that. We're going to get rid of that. I'm going to have semicolons at the end of my lines. That's how we're going to do it here. That's how I'm going to roll. Uh, this is something I'm going to enforce later with linting and we'll discuss that. But for now, I'm just going to add them. So that's other than that, I'm happy with this component for now, just because I'm going to do another commit about Next.js pretty soon. Uh, this one, I don't need to, I mean, this is kind of cool. This is, this might be relevant at some point. We're going to need to do things with head possibly. So I'll keep this. Uh, and I'll keep the title here too. Yeah, create next app. I'll just call it X. Uh, class name, no, we're not going to have that for now. That's weird that head is within a div if this is going to be in the metadata. I think this is where I'm confused. Yeah, let's not even get head yet. I just want such a basic component. You know, let's not get ahead of ourselves at all. Let's do that example, in fact, from JSX, because why not? What was that JSX example here? This one here. Let's just do that kind of hello world, right? Why? Just so we can see that's, that's as, that's as basic of a react app as you're going to get. So there's our hello world. So you can see this seems simple enough. Uh, X function home. I don't think it even needs to have this. This could be an anonymous function. I feel like this, this is, uh, this is where it gets into like, I want to, I always want to whittle the code down to its most base components. That can get a bit tedious sometimes. So it's going to be a balancing act while we're doing that. I'm just going to look at it here within pages. I just want to look at what I did in my previous code because I want to know how you export these. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the name doesn't matter. I called it home page. Maybe that's what it was called back in the day. Let's just call it home. Other than that, that's basic. And what did I do for app here? Yeah. I've added a bit to app because I've typescripted. Let's, let's not get into that yet. So, so let's get back to what we have. So you see now it's pretty basic and we don't need this API right now. We're not even going to have app backend API for quite a while. 
sorry guys, this is, there's going to be a lot of front end stuff here for a while, but it's not going to feel like front end. Hopefully it's not going to be all about pixels and stuff. Like we're going to do some, there's going to be some logical stuff going on, you know? Um, but yeah, communicating with the back end and stuff, that's going to take some time. You know, I need to find the right use case because you can actually do a lot with, with just what you have here. So, uh, so we'll see, we'll see on that. But anyways, what do we got here? So let's go to the changes and let's just see what's changed. Close all these so we can look at the changes. So the first thing we created a git ignore file, right? Uh, we've created the lock file. We don't have to look at this. I'll peek at it. It's going to be, I'm not even going to peek at it. It's this, it's a massive auto generated file that essentially locks which packages you have, uh, you've grabbed with your NPM I command. And, and it's essentially, those are the packages that are being used and you, if, if a package changes, let's say you have some control with that lock file to, to keep your dependencies as they are. If let's say one of the NPM packages gets updated and it breaks something, which happens all the time. So that's one of the beauties of the lock file. And, and we'll get more into that because I don't know everything about the lock file. So that's another thing where we can learn that together. Um, again, skipping that we know about the pack, the JSON. So I just added those basic the scripts that it generated and those dependencies. Uh, we got the readme here. So it looks like it's generated its own readme. Um, it's a helpful one, I guess, you know, I don't need to know any of this stuff though. We're going to go through this one by one. So I'm actually going to not do the readme changes. I'm going to say, discard those as well, because, Hey, the readme was fine the way it was. And we want to keep this basic. So it's added the app file. We need, we need that. Uh, it doesn't need to be exactly this way. But it's I've, I've cut it down as much as possible. You know, we're gonna need to import the global CSS. We're gonna need to declare this my app. We're gonna need to export this way. So actually, we could probably just let's we can cut it down a tiny bit and do that. I think. I mean, this is a goal of the whole project. You know, the less lines, the better. You know, I mean, I've essentially simplified that. I've I've done nothing, but I've simplified it. There's less lines there. You you go oh, okay, export default this. You know. You don't have to see down the line. Oh, it, it exported my app and, and that's what was declared up above. No, let's just, it's just here, you know? So assuming that works, it might be completely not work. I don't know, but I should. So, so again, we've simplified that. That's the next change. We got the index file, which we've cut down to that basic JSX hello world example. We got the favicon and we got our global CSS. So now before we commit this, uh, I think we need to test it, of course. Uh, now that readme file explained how to test things, but you're just going to, you can see it on your own if you want to just trust me. It's, it's related to the scripts. Actually, let's get into the scripts. Don't trust me. Never trust me. I shouldn't have said that. So the scripts here are essentially what you can do with an NPM run command. So NPM run one of these commands will do, will, will do what you want here. And, and in this case, dev is what we want because an NPM run the dev script will essentially give us a developer version of Next.js to run. And you'll see here it's ready, started, and just like that. And then I can reload the page to the top right there. Take a sip of my, my Red Bull. Hello world. Sorry about that slurping motion there. I need, I need to solve that as well. A quieter for that. Um, so there's our hello world, right? So we built a hello world next JS app at this point. This is where I was back in when was it let's see here uh august 8th that's when i committed the first of these projects where i thought hey let's play around with next and just start going with it so just for you guys to get the vibe this is essentially the same stuff i'm doing here you know uh so yeah now we got our hello world it worked i'm gonna leave this running i'm gonna close the terminal for now though so we're happy with that so this should be another commit I think, because now we're showing the minimal amount of change to get Next.js up and running. And then we build on that. So um, let's just put next.js initial commit. Very original, hey? Maybe that's too unoriginal, actually. Let's just say set up Next.js or added Next.js. Let's not overthink it, right? Added Next.js. Uh, we commit that. Again, I can dump it to the cloud. You see now there's not a cloud icon. Now it's an up and a down arrow. So the, the down arrow is saying there's nothing new to grab from the repository in the cloud. Nothing's, no one else has slipped something in, but you can push up what you have. Uh, and I could not do it now. I'm going to just to show you the process. So I push it, you get the little spinning arrows. 
and 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 at some point we'll get more into Git commits to branches and stuff because you wouldn't typically just push to to what was this is essentially like a master branch. This is the 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 source of truth branch we're using, but typically you would branch off of that and do your work in a branch, and then come time to add it to the source of truth branch. That's when we would go through the PR process, which we. We'll probably get into after setup. I'm not going to PR the setup stuff because it's too basic, but we'll PR at the point where we get to like adding any kind of component. And I could probably even PR this to be honest, but I just don't want to because I it's it's so basic in my opinion, this part that I don't feel it would be useful to, to, to do PR comments. I want to be able to have some comments because looking back at the code after we do a PR, when, when we start a PR, there probably will be some things where it's like, oh, did could I do it that way? Whereas this, I feel like this is this is uh, established. Could be wrong though. Actually, that's an assumption I probably shouldn't make, to be honest. I'm going to, but I probably should PR everything, but I'm not going to this time. So I'm going to start with a bad example. Um, so we can see from the folder structure here that these two grayed out ones, those are the git because they're git ignored. So you see next and node modules are git ignored. And if there were an out folder, that also would be git ignored. Uh, so let's see, how far have we gotten along in this? So we've done Git, we've done NPM, we got Next.js up. So now we can get into some of the configuration with Next.js because I, I want this to be as tight of a configuration as we can think of. And if at any point you guys feel like we should add something to, to any of this, please tell me. Or if you feel any of it's superfluous, or if you feel like you're, he's forgetting this, uh, yeah, speak up at any point or forever hold your peace, you know? So. One of the things I wanted to mention here is that we need to, I, oh, I probably should have added this to the next JS initial commit because it's, it's pretty, pretty basic, but we need a next config because we want to set react strict mode and essentially all the react strict mode. Uh, do I have a summary of it? No, I don't, but it just, it's just more picky about your code. You know, you, we want the code. We want all these tools to be as picky as possible about your code so that you don't even let something slip in. And that's going to, that's like the theme of everything that I'm doing tonight, actually is getting all this tooling set up so that you, you give yourself the best chance to write clean code if you have tools doing the watching for you. Because going going back to the trusting thing, you shouldn't trust yourself, I would say. Because uh, you don't need to anyways. You know, we have, we have machines to do that for us now. So as we see here from React strict mode, all we have to do is create a next.config.js file and put that code in it. Um, in the background, I've done that secretly and just, just put it exactly where it's said to. And, and just as simple as this is all we need to do. And I'm gonna open the term. Well, I'll open the terminal to show you that, that if we save the config, it's going to complain. I think, let's see, it did not. Oh, there we go. Found a change in the config. So when you change next configs, you do have to restart the next, uh, dev script. So you just kill it and start it again. And it's probably not going to make any visible difference to us. It's not going to complain because the code is so basic that I, I think we probably meet the strict rules. I could be wrong, but I don't even, I literally don't even know where the error would occur. I, I mean, maybe it'd be in this console. Maybe it'd be on the hello world app. I don't know, but we didn't see anything from turning on strict. So good. Um, so that was part of next that I skipped. So I'm going to have to slip that in as another commit here. So, uh, added added react strict mode simple and now someone can use that commit in the future if they wanted to i'm not going to push that one let's just move on to the next one don't have to push them all like that uh it's saved in a way it's saved locally at least i guess if your computer died it's gone so let's move on to the next thing uh which is editor config this is another basic one you see this in most uh most setups I find, most repos have this. I like it. It doesn't always work for me, actually, to be honest. Maybe we can figure out together why it doesn't, but it's basically just uh, a file that kind of tells your your IDE, like VS Code or whatever thing you're editing the code in, if it supports this file, it basically just tells it how it wants you to format it. So when you save the file, do you want to add a new line at the bottom? And if you press tab, it, do you want it to use tabs or spaces and how many? Et cetera, et cetera. So, but like I say, it doesn't always work, but at least it formalizes slightly. At least there's a file that says, here's the format I want, you know? So that's something. So going back, I'm going to create the file. 
I'm gonna do a config. And I'm gonna half pre-bake it, half not, because uh, I told you guys I won't do anything pre-baked so, completely. So we'll, we'll look at the file here. Here's an example file. that's right from the, the main page from editor config. We'll use that example file, but I'm gonna cut it down to look basically like my other file looked. Uh, and I need to reference it. So let's close these to get these out of the way and look at the file. So there's, again, a lot of crap in here we don't need, you know? I just find like all these, I mean, sometimes comments are cool, but all these words do not add very much for me. I mean, in this case, maybe they do, but it's like, do you even need to know these configs? If you need to know what this is, just go check, it, go look it up, you know? It's like, oh, okay, this is the topmost editor config. What am I, am I gonna put that to false? I don't know what false will do, you know? Actually, topmost, I guess it's obvious what false would do, but I don't want to mess with this, essentially. This is something you change once, so it doesn't need a comment, in my opinion. Um, and going back to my opinion, I'm just going to take what I had before, but I'll, I'll show you that it's uh, it's basically the same thing. Let's just look at it here and see what I have, and I'm going to copy it. I'm just going to go through them. So basically, yeah, root true, that was in the code. All of these are the same things. Let's just copy it here, and I'll bring it over. So we can see, so back to the code here, I'm gonna make a new tab and I'll put them side by side or I'll attempt to. There we go, so they're side by side there. So that's what I had before and this was, this was what I just copied. That's the example. So as you can see, I just kind of chopped out most of this. This is saying what files it's applicable to. I want it to be applicable to all files. I alphabetize stuff here. I like this char set, so I just copied it right from there. Uh, and is the, is the next one indenting style? Uh, is it indenting size? Yeah, this is this example file is all over the place, but I actually like this one here. Indent again, alphabetize the indent size of two. So when I press tab, I wanted to do basically two of the spaces. That's what I'm specifying there. You could say if you put tab here, it'd be two tabs. You know. Uh, Insert final new line. Yeah, I like to add a new line at the end of files. Just it's a consistency thing. And something that's not in their example file, but I like is this trim trailing white space. And we can just quickly peek at what that is here. If we editor config. So set to true to remove any white space characters preceding new line characters and false to ensure it doesn't. I'm I'm perfectly happy to trim white space. So if setting that to true in any way helps VS Code do that, great. Again, it doesn't always work for me, but aspirationally, I'm gonna add that because I like that feature. Other than that, I don't need any of these specific ones, you know, the make files this way, that kind of thing. I think there was a markdown one in, in the example, was there? No, there wasn't even any useful other ones. So, so essentially I've whittled it back down to what is again, relevant. So let's try this here, if I save, Okay, it didn't work on itself. Oh, maybe because I don't have the editor config extension installed? I actually do. So you see, it doesn't always work for me, but let's just say we set it up because most projects have it. So. so now we have our editor config file. It looks correct. With React strict mode, are you 6 strict mode rules enforced too? I believe they are, you know? That's a hell of a question. Let's look that up. React strict. What does it mean, you know? Strict mode. Strict mode is a tool for highlighting potential problems in the application like fragment. Okay, you can enable strict mode. The above example, strict mode checks will not be. I see, so it comes into the console logs at least. Uh, it's a good question though about your ES6. Are ES6 strict mode rules enforced? I would say they probably are. Uh, we're gonna get into it further anyways. When we add TypeScript, I'm also gonna put TypeScript strict mode. So. That's all the stricts that I know how to do, to be honest. If there's specific ES6 stricting that I can do, I'd, I'd love to know about it and I will add that for sure. So thank you Ezra for the, the comment there. Um, but yeah, for now, I'm just gonna set up the editor config then. So there we go. Again, I've got to go back into my commits. I see that I've just, oh, sorry guys, flip to it here. Uh, I gotta, I'm like, the, I'm a BJ at the same time. So I gotta remember what I'm showing you guys here. So I just wanted to add the editor config. Simple, I'm just gonna say add, added, editor config, capitalize the C. So again, a real simple one. That's another another one done. Something I like about git commits is like, it's a sense of accomplishment, you know? It's like, that piece is done, you know? Whereas when you have all these unsaved files, it's like, it, it's just, it feels like it's, nothing's formally done, you know? 
Um, after that, let's go, let's jump to SCSS. So SCSS is like CSS, but better, essentially. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we'll just go to that page as well. So CSS with superpowers, that's a cool way to put it. Yeah, I like that. Um, basically, if you're familiar with CSS, you could just, you could, you could do this change and then never change the code. It works just the same, just like with TypeScript, where bo both of these are very cool that way in that all the languages that, the language additions I'm doing, like, like I'm not writing CSS or JavaScript, I'm doing SCSS and TypeScript, but essentially it's the same thing in a lot of ways. Uh, like, what do they call it? A superset or something like that? It, it's an on top of. So if you know how to do one, you know how to do the other, but then there's more you can do. And that's what I like is just having the option to do more, essentially. That's what I like about these tools. So that's something with SCSS and we can quickly get into, what does it say here? Learn SAS. I'd like to see some basic examples just to see some Coolio stuff it can do. Variables, that's one, something CSS can't can't properly do. It's got a weird way that it can do it, but I like these. And then also they're, they're, they're rendered or what's the right wording for it? It's, it's generated, it generates CSS files in the end. So these variables turn into to hard-coded values. Whereas the CSS way of doing variables that they never really are hard coded and it's kind of a whole other thing. It's just a whole other thing, honestly, but they exist. You could, there are CSS variables with this var command, but, but don't think of SCSS variables as the same because they're not. Uh, nesting, oh my God, that's a beautiful one. That's something CSS should have done from the start, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, I don't know the argument for not doing it. Maybe it was hard. Maybe maybe this is not a good way in some ways, but I love to be able to do that. And you can see here that CSS versus like what's generated versus what you write. And it's just so much less repetitive, like nav UL, nav LI, nav A. No, it's all part of the nav. It's like, let's just nest this puppy, you know? And that's, that's, that's again where you simplify it, you know? You, you don't need to, with these, it's like you need to see that the word nav is there to know that they're connected. And just that alone is like a, it's like an abstraction or a little, a little more work your brain has to do to interpret that. And it's like, that's, those are the things I want to avoid in general when I'm coding. It's like any, any time it's like, don't make me think, you know, I have a book that's called don't make me think it's about UX, but it's the same with source code. I think it's like, if you're writing comments, it's like, why am I reading your comments? What, what, why was, why could this not have been explained in the code? You know, that's a whole other rant. Let's, let's avoid that rant for now. That's like a tabs and spaces thing, I think. So back to, oh yes, so SAS. I wanted to put SAS in there. Um, let's read how Next.js suggests adding it because we want it to be part of the framework. And another thing, I'll just slip more into Next.js. I haven't really gone into tons of details, but one of the things it does for you is Webpack. And Webpack is, is again, we can look at that really quick. I didn't even make a link to that one, so I'll just search it. Webpack bundles your assets and a lot of other cool stuff. But basically it takes all these different files you got, your SCSS as it sh shows, well, it's calling them SAS here, that's another format, but the same thing. And it converts it to this basic, the CSS, the JS, that kind of stuff. And next JS hides all of that so that you don't have to worry about it because it's tedious, honestly. I mean, if you wanna be hardcore, sure, set up your own web pack, but do you need to? I don't think so. And I think that's been proven again and again with, with frameworks like this, so. They have something for it as Next.js has in their documentation with a lot of stuff. You just search here and we just searched for it too. Let's say SCSS. There you go. Custom webpack config build. Yeah. The, the formal word for it typically is SAS. So it's better to search that, but I prefer the SCSS format. Uh, I'll quickly mention that as well then too. So yeah, there's different syntaxes for this SAS SCSS. There's this one that's closer to CSS, which is why I prefer it. And, and it's also those files, my understanding is you could just take a CSS file and make an SCSS file. Whereas if you took CSS file and dump that into a SAS file, your work's not done. So for that reason alone, I don't like it, you know? But the SAS one is just, it's similar. I think it's, uh, I'd like to see a comparison, you know? SAS versus SCSS. Uh, I'd like to see a comparison on their website, you know? They should be the first result. Basically, it's just uh, one has brackets, one's tabs, I think. There's probably some other details, but we don't care anyways. So you search SAS, you find it right there. You say, okay, npm install SAS. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, we open up our terminal again, and we just run that command that they've told us to run. And just like that, we're SASed up. 
and we can look at get and we can see what's changed. And we can see, okay, very straightforward. It's just added one dependency, SAS. Okay. What else do you need to do? Uh, again, the beauty of the beauty of Next.js is you're basically done. You basically just have to rename your file now. So let's try that. Actually, so if we go back into the terminal, do we have that dev console still? Yeah. So the app's still running. There's our hello world. Now let's change this to SCSS. That's gonna make it angry because we're still referencing the CSS in the Java in the JavaScript. So then we go here and we make that SCSS and we save that. And there we go. So that's it. You've converted it. And and now um what's a good example? Let's let's say within body uh the div will be background color of black. There we go. And we see that. So Look at, as you can see, this is nested div within the body. So we're doing nesting. So that's our test. So the CSS worked. So just like that, we've added, we've added way more functionality. If, if this was still an, a CSS file, I, that wouldn't have worked. I don't know what that would have, what would have happened, but wouldn't have worked probably. So, uh, so now we go into our commits to see what's changed in the end. So the lock file that changes every time you do any kind of NPM installation stuff. So don't worry about that. Just you always want to, you typically want to commit your lock file. There's scenarios where you don't want to, but we're not going to get into those for a long time. Um, so what have, so what's changed? So the, the CSS file became an SCSS file that we just changed them a single letter and we added that dependency. Great. So added uh, SAS support. So we've added SAS support to our next JS project, just like that. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't keep that little nesting change because I don't care about it, by the way. So moving on, now we get to the, the some sweetness here of TypeScript. And I could go off on a tangent for a long time about TypeScript and type systems and static type checking. But I don't know if I need to. I would say that the advantage, I mean, how do they sell it here? Do they have any kind of cool video? Yeah, basically you're seeing a little bit of it here. Property name does not exist on type. Yeah. Uh, so this is trying to show a console log. I don't, let's not use the example. I, I will explain it slightly because it's a little bit easier. Um, once we have a type system, and I don't know how familiar everyone is, is with type systems. It's in a lot of other programming languages, but basically you explicitly declare what everything is because JavaScript is extremely loose with that. Uh, you could you could have a, a, str a string, a number, it's very loose. And, and I mean, it's still loose even with TypeScript in that the code would, would render fine, but TypeScript catches these mistakes before you let them go into the browser to become like failures that are unexpected. By, by declaring, this is gonna be a string, this is gonna be an integer, this or a number, sorry, for TypeScript and objects and declaring the objects, it actually gives you so much, honestly. Like it's, it, for me, when I first started hearing about TypeScript and even type systems in general, I was, I was kind of frivolous to it. Uh, and then I thought, oh, who cares, you know? But, but what it, 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 it powers your IDE up, you know, it, like VS Code, because it just gives it so much information about what's going on in your code. When you're explicit, essentially you're, you're telling the editor all these things and then it can kind of help you along the way and be like, Hey, you, you know, your object, it's not doing what you think it is. Or, or in like this example here, uh, I mean, if we go into this example, so it's saying names not declared and this red means it, it aired in the console, I guess it possibly, but I, let's assume that's the example for now. So, so that's bad, right? What you wanted was this to have never happened, you know, uh, actually maybe this is with TypeScript. No, cause there's no type here. So let's say next and see what happens. Oh God, these examples suck, you know? There should be one example that just is very clear, like, oh, okay, at least to get the first type, you know, because I did not prepare an example. So let's just add TypeScript to get further into it, but just, just static typing good. There you go. You're going to like it. You're going to like it. So to add TypeScript again, let's next JS it's to the rescue. It's so easy to add. You basically just create this TS config file with a, I don't know if I have touch command for windows. Let's see. Touch is basically just, Hey, create an empty file, but let's try it here. I don't know if it works touch. Yeah. I didn't think it would, but I ran it anyways, so that I look like a noob. 
Um, okay, well, this isn't rocket science. Let's just make the file then. It's not rocket surgery. Is a shirt that I used to have 15 years ago that I lost. Great shirt. All right, so we've created a TS config file. Uh, what does it say to do next? Let's just sw switch to it here again. And again, just for how we got to this, I mean, I mean, there is like, if you were just starting off, you wouldn't know about TypeScript, maybe you wouldn't know about Next.js. So I, I can only go so far to say, to, to explain some of, of these things as to how I discovered it, because I don't even remember how I, how I found it, but it's good to know that these things, and even if you just searched for like best front end stacks, best programming languages to make web apps, you know, just start putting out searches and opening every single result on the first page and the second page. And you just, you read all of those and, and then you, you kind of, you kind of come to a, a dartboard of suggestions and you see most of them are, are here or there. And that's the way I work with a lot of this stuff is, is like, let's see what 20 people say, you know, the, the top 20 results. And that's, I don't know. I mean, it depends. Some people Google different ways, but that's always helped me is, is like, it's almost like that don't trust approach too, where, where I don't trust myself to, to, to type, I copy paste. It's the same with results. It's like, I don't trust that the first result's good, but if, if I, I'm just going to get so many that it's, it's, it becomes obvious, you know, if 15 out of 20 people are talking about Next.js, it's like, okay, let's, let's start there at least. So anyways, um, back to, yeah, so back to Next.js, we type, let's say we know about TypeScript, we type, hey, I want to install TypeScript. Okay. Uh, I think it's just this link. Okay, that's actually, maybe their search sucks here. Let's go back to their docs and just see if it is that easy. TypeScript. That shouldn't be so hard to find, yeah. Okay, well, I have the link, but I don't know why it's, that's a bad search there, so. Link will be provided. It's probably where, oh yeah, I guess, yeah. It's not in their search, but it's in their basic features, so. So I've created that, so now I run dev again. It's probably gonna, it might have complained. No, it doesn't know about the file though, so let's. We have to stop the dev run. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't flip again. There we go. So I just I just checked that uh, npm run dev is not not running anymore. I turned that off and I'm turning it back on so that it can uh, do its magic to the ts config file. And nice, we got an error. Our first my first error in the stream because I don't know what the hell it's complaining about. Ah, okay. It looks like you're trying to use TypeScript, but you don't have. Oh, okay, fair enough. Probably somewhere in these instructions it said I had to install TypeScript first. I mean. Pretty simple anyways, it's saying how to do it. And did I make a note to TypeScript? Yeah, if we go back to the TypeScript website, it probably said pretty simply how to do that there. Install locally. So no, that's not what I wanted. I want to install in a project. Maybe it was the first button. Oops. Oh, I see, it just was an anchor. Oh man. Okay, yeah, their buttons aren't so nice there. Docs. I just. Should it be so hard to find the install command? It was easy with Next.js. All right, well, we know the command anyways. Next.js recommended it, but these guys. So let's follow their advice here. And so this is saying to do the npm install, it's the same as the npm i command. i is short for install. Save dev is saying that, the, that we want to make the dependencies dev dependencies. In other words, we don't need to ship these dependencies in the browser product, the final product that the user loads that that's on the front end, they don't need anything involving TypeScript basically, because that's just, that'll all be abstracted out. So let's run this command as it suggests. And it's uh, reasonably quick. I have a reasonably fast internet, but a computer could use some work. That'll be for another, another stream. I'll, I'll probably do upgrading my computer hopefully one day. So we installed what we needed. We're going to run that dev command again because it still needs to do its magic to the TS config file. So there we go. We detected TypeScript in your project and created a TS config file. Thank you. So hello world worked once again. So there we go. And the reason that that works without having to change anything else is because JavaScript files still work too. So we haven't converted any files yet to the TypeScript format. So hello world is, is still, I mean, it'll work either way, but. We shouldn't expect it not to work, you know? Let's see what it's changed so far. TS config, it's changed a lot, actually. I mean, created. It, it, I mean, on this side, it created very little. Those dev dependencies that we wanted, that was from our command. Uh, this TS config file is interesting. We need to go through this to figure this out. Uh, and this next file, this looks pretty boilerplate. Uh, boilerplate basically means just like a file that uh, you need to have, you know? There's nothing I can do to this, but it, I need it. 
it's something for Next.js to work. So looks good to me, you know, no, nothing I'm going to mess with there. Uh, as far as the TS config file, this is an interesting one and we could get into this deep if we wanted to. I don't think we're going to, uh, but I do have back to the strict comment and react strict. I do have the TypeScript strict that I wanted to add and I made a note of that flag. So we can look at flags here within the, this TS config uh, page and it kind of explains what the flags are. The strict flag enables a wide range of type checking behavior that results in stronger guarantees of program correctness. That sounds good, right? So adding that is extremely easy. Uh, in the TS config file, if we switch to it that, that was generated, there is strict and it is false. And you'll actually see in the Next.js documentation, it mentions this, that it'll be off by default and you would like it on. So, uh, and that's something too, but just getting back to the docs, I read through these docs. Like it's not fun, but it helps, you know, uh, like just reading through the documentation, uh, especially these little boxes. Whenever you see one of these boxes, it's like a little nugget of information sometimes, you know? Sometimes you can ignore a lot of this and just just be like, here's the little tips, you know, like that, that can be enough. Or at least if you're browsing, you know, get those tips. Those are helpful. So, so we've set strict to true, have we? Did we? No, we did not yet. Let's do that. Strict to true. Uh, I could commit and then change this later, but let's not. This is a simple change. Um, some of the other ones, like most of these we're going to trust. This is cool. Again, where VS Code is, uh, your editor is helping you out is that it knows about a, a TS config file. I think this is part of types, actually. I'm not sure how it knows where these tooltips are coming from, but they're extremely useful. So essentially, even without looking at documentation, you can hover over these and see a lot of what these are. So the target here, that's gonna be what you want the TypeScript to be converted into in JavaScript. And these ESs are essentially uh, like a version standard from a, a group called ECMA, I think, ECMAScript. Yeah, if you look up ECMAScript here, it's these this ES abbreviation, and it's essentially just the standard for how JavaScript should be, because each browser is kind of allowed to implement it their own way. And we'll get into that in another video involving things like this Can I Use website, which essentially tells you that certain browsers don't support certain things that, that you would expect. You know, things that are in this specification are not necessarily supported for everyone. And that's something to, to consider just forever. Uh, with web programming and until we come up with some better solutions. So. so ES5 is a pretty old one. And it's it, and a reason to target that is because that's going to get you a lot of support as far as uh, the app, what browsers it can support. ES5 is especially for Internet Explorer. So if you want people on almost any version of Internet Explorer, I don't know if I ever supported ES6 completely. I don't think it did. I think they just switched to Edge or whatever the, whatever the heck it's called. So it's nice to target ES5. You don't need to necessarily though. And there's actually an argument to be had for not targeting ES5 and for targeting something like ES6 or higher. Because if you specifically know which browsers you're targeting or you're only interested in some of the newer generations, you can actually save yourself a little code and make your code a little smaller by not targeting these because then it doesn't need to add these things called polyfills, which are essentially, if, you, if you've written some modern code and TypeScript has to convert this to ES6, it's going to have to add some additional code to make that functionality work that's not even supported in that browser. So that's, that's the basic idea of polyfills, and, and we won't get into it too much more for now, but something to consider when you're targeting stuff. And if you hover over it here, you can see all the different suggestions. And you see ES5 is, is one of the older ones for sure. And we're going to write an ES next. And you can see ES next is the newest one. And we'll look up that one really quick. Actually, we're still in ECMAScript here, so we can see ES Next, which sounds cool. And actually, hey, we're using Next.js and we're using ES Next, right? It just makes sense. Uh, it's the dynamic name, though. It's going to change basically just the stuff that's in this stage four proposals, essentially, I think. That's what it seems to say here. And these proposals are, certain, are basically the features that get added at different stages. And it's, it's actually the same for the CSS as well in that there are CSS proposals, I believe, and different versions. And there's another tool built into Next.js that's already running in the background called, uh, what is it, Post, Post SCSS, I think? Yeah, a tool for transforming CSS. No, I could be wrong about that. Is it Post CSS? Let me just try to remember here, because that doesn't sound right. But I think I have a config file for it in my old one. Oh, it is Post CSS, I guess. 
Sounds, sounds weird there with this uh, very uh, Ouija style look here. But basically this is another piece of the target puzzle in that this will kind of polyfill your CSS and, and will genericize your CSS to work on different browsers. So it's another thing to consider. Uh, and and Next.js has great support for it as well in that you just make this post CSS file. We won't get too far into it, but you just make a file and, and, and it's ready right away. It picks it up and it's like, hey, I'm already using post CSS. Thanks for your custom changes. I'll, I'll put those into consideration. And there's really not a lot of setup that you have to do. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, and you can see they probably mentioned post CSS here somewhere, yeah, and how to customize it and stuff and what it can do and and the different features it adds. Uh, so getting back to the TypeScript, uh, so we got our libs here. We're gonna need these libs for TypeScript, essentially things for manip for the, the things. That, how best to describe this lib? List of library files to include in the compilation, right? Things we're gonna need to do with. We're gonna need to work with DOM functions, DOM iterable functions and ES next functions and everything that, that includes, which is also down. So you pretty much include almost everything in this list here by just including those few, you could put web workers in there too. You could capitalize these based on how the examples are, but you don't have to mess with these allow JS. Yeah, we have to allow JS. I think, uh, actually, I don't know if we do, to be honest. I mean, we have some config files that are JS, but they're not going to be compiled. So we probably don't need to. I'm going to leave it here as true, but we're going to not have any JS typically. Uh, it's all going to be TypeScript. So skip lib check. I think we probably want that true. We probably don't want to mess with a lot of these. A lot of the defaults are pretty decent. You could alphabetize these. I'm not going to worry about that for now. So let's say that's good. Did I have any other notes for things I wanted to worry about? Oh, yes, the module path alias. This is another cool thing. Another cool thing, guys. Uh, absolute imports and module path alias. Next.js automatically supports the tsconfig paths and base URL. So these are two pretty cool things. So if you do base URL here, my understanding is essentially it lets you import things in a much clearer way. So we're gonna add base URL. Uh, I'm just adding it here, by the way, to the, to the file, like it suggested right there, as it says here. And what that gets you, as it says here, is the ability to import without having to play around with the, let me just show you here. At a certain point in your files, here's an import here. You get into this mess here, this dot dot, and then you'll have another one and another one, depending on where it's nested. And I like to just be able to say this, you know, everything's just start, let's just start from the root always, because then if you move that file somewhere else, you're still referencing the root. So you never have to mess with your imports or update imports or anything. It dep I mean, depending. In certain scenarios, you still have to, but uh, I think this is my only import. So I, I changed that to base. Oh, what did I anger there? Okay, so it's not working because I believe, because I've changed the TS config, but I need to refresh, I bet. Let's check it out here. Uh, well, it never said that, but let's try it. So. Sometimes when you change things in the TS config, you have to restart and Next.js doesn't tell you about them, but let's just see if this fixes it. So how's our hello world now? Yeah, that fixed it. So there we go. So that's a, it's a cleaner import, you know? We don't need those dot dots. All the dot dot slash thing is telling you is that it go one directory back in this case, because we're in the pages directory. We want to go to the root, but let's just always assume the root with our imports. It's just cleaner. And another way that's cleaner too, and, and actually is how I used it in the past, but I, I want to try using this method this time uh, because I ended up just doing base everything, but you can also do this like an alias method with paths. And that's also explained here is you can add these paths uh, and you can actually do both of them. So I might need a path down the road perhaps, but you can also give these alias paths. So I could do something like and this is how it's done in my current code base. So I do something like that. I add that there. And now, actually, let's do an example that's legit. It would be styles, right? Because styles exists. So that's like that. So then I could do some, so I save that. And then I could do this. So essentially, this becomes base URL. Or, well, it doesn't need to be. The reason where paths could be useful is, let's say this isn't, this isn't actually there, you know? So here it still looks nice and clean. But 
but I, I don't really have any of that. I'm just, I'm perfectly happy to just go from base URL. You know, it's explicit anyways, and I like being explicit. So, so that's fine the way it is. And I think that was it for TypeScript setup. So yeah, so we've essentially set up TypeScript the way I wanted to. So let's again review, uh, close this, close that, close that, and let's review what's changed. So the file, that, the auto-generated file, the dev dependencies, our TS config file, which we've we've iterated through. I actually didn't mention a few things. I, I kind of skipped over. I mean, I did. This is default stuff, so let's not worry about it too much. But there is this include and excludes folders. It's something to note. Just like git ignore, we don't want the node modules folder in our compilation. I mean, we want parts of it, but only the parts that we care about. So typically, we want to exclude the entire folder. It's not our source code. And these are the files we want to include: TS and TSX. Good. Very clear. So we've done TypeScript now, uh, and and then here we changed the path because we've added the bit, we've changed that. Oh, I've, I'm not done. I'm not done, guys. We don't actually have TypeScript file yet, do we? What we have uh, is a bunch of JavaScript files. So this is another cool little secret sauce with Next.js is is, mo is a lot of these files can be changed to TS. Um, not the config file, I don't think actually. I don't think I I think the config file has to stay as JS, and I think that that's what I did with it as well. Yeah, so I'm not changing that, because I can't. But what we can change is our two public pages. So let's change these to TypeScript. Here's how easy it is, P. And this is an extension peeve of mine. Those files were .js, but they had JSX in them. So I would say Next.js should have generated them as JSX, but Maybe that's less compatible. I'm going to be an extension uh, picky, picky guy, and I'm going to do TSX, which just is to, to, it gives you a cool icon too. That's pretty much the biggest part of it, is that it gives you a cool icon, if you have the VS Code icons extension. And I'm also going to change this one to TSX. So now those are two base files, so it's probably going to complain, and as you see, it's complaining. But again, the magic, let's kill some of these consoles. I opened too damn many. Yeah, so it's complaining about stuff. So let's kill it again. A lot of times when you change these base things, you just got to restart the dev command and it kind of figures it out. It kind of reorients itself and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, there's TSX here now. Okay, fine. So hopefully that's the case here. Yeah, and there we go. Our hello world's back. So so now we've changed these to TSX files and we didn't have to change any of the code. And it's perfectly happy with this file. And we do see some issues here, which are interesting. And what these are are our first TypeScript errors. Essentially, these two have our any's, which is a terrible way to explain it, but let's explain this clearly. TypeScript errors, first of all, sometimes are hard to interpret. Uh, this one here, simple enough, is saying binding element component implicitly has an any type. So we haven't defined, for this function, my app, we haven't defined, and this is an object that comes in, and we haven't defined what component and page props are. So by default, they get the type of any. And because we're on strict, it's not going to allow that. I think that's I think that's something strict does with TypeScript. I could be wrong, but we don't want to allow any any's anyway. That's confusing, but any is like, I don't know. And it, and it makes it harder to infer things. So uh, jumping back to my previous code, I just want to... I'm going to salvage my previous code occasionally because it's it's just a little easier. I just want to see what I did in this case because it's a very simple file anyways. Uh, app props, right. And and I think actually, did I? I don't think I have it in here, but you know that's actually part of the Next.js documentation, I believe. It, yeah, custom app. And if we look at TypeScript, uh, I think that might have been part of their TypeScript documentation actually. Yeah, here we go. Even in their TypeScript documentation, they actually clarified that once you've got TypeScript, uh, so this app props is a type. It's a defined type. It's part Next has already defined that type, and it it knows what these things are and and many more perhaps. So we're gonna take this import and import type. You can import types, and we're going to put that in here. So this let's get into another thing: the order of imports. That's something else I care about. Let's, for ordering of imports, I think we should do files, types, uh, sp specific components, and then like 
like sorry, default exports, and then exports of specific uh, specific objects. Basically, it'd be like, let me let me try to give an example here. Why is this gray? Oh, because I'm not using it. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I just let me just finish this import idea. So it'd be like another one would be like that. Let's say that's like a default import, and then a final one would be like that. Let's say. So essentially, that's the order in which I've been doing imports and separating them. And I do separate them with these new lines because I feel they're different. These are just importing files directly. You're just dumping them in. Uh, or or sometimes adding libs. I like to separate that. And I like to put it at the top because that's almost like separate from the modules in some way. It's, it's not really, but this is just the logic I've, I've decided on. Then you have your import types. Then I have where it's like an import type. There could be an argument that these should be at the top, but... Maybe that can be discussed in a, in a further one. And, and that's something we can get into if we have a contribution guide where we can we can write a document that kind of says, here's how we want this, here's how we want that. It's harder to implicitly uh, lint this rule of, of what way I'd like the imports ordered. Uh, there is some rules, but I don't think there is one for import type or for importing directly files. So that's why it doesn't quite sort the way I like, but maybe it's good enough, you know, we'll see. Anyway, these aren't relevant. So from the example, I wanted to import that app props. We don't need this little comment here. Uh, so we have the import and we need to use app props. So what we're going to say is the app props type, and you can see it here. This is a, a definition of what it has. So it has component, uh, which is what we need. It has page props. It doesn't talk about page props, but it, it must have it. It doesn't get into all the details of what this has here. But all we have to do is basically say this object is going to have those types. And that's that for that, in that way. They're not all like that. You don't always define it that way, but for in this case, it works perfect. So now, here's the magic of the ID. Now when I hover over component, we know what it is. It's a next component type, and it, it has these aspects. Same with page props. Uh, I mean, why is page props in any still? Hmm. Well, it is, it is what it is. Maybe it's just an any. Let's not, uh, that's, that's the way that next has decided to define it. Good enough for us, you know? So I've done some very minimal changes there. And on the index file, we don't have to change anything. This is already, uh, yeah, there's no types necessary to define. And let's let's do an example type here. And let's get it into the JSX side of it again here. That example, that first example was a constant actually. So let's use it like that. Go back into it here. So now we could do like that. That's essentially the same code and well, we don't really have to define element because it's very clear this is JSX. What we should do, let's take this string then and see if we can do that. Uh, just call it uh, the message. We're going to use single quotes. And we're going to have, I've already forgotten how this works. Is that like that? Yeah, I think that's how that works. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So now we've written a bit of dynamic JSX and we've used some elements. Now, if you highlight over message, you can see, well, it's just clearly that. This wasn't a good example for me because it actually infers these types. So it, it's not, it, let's say, let's say message was coming from here. Then it's an any, and then I can say, hey, I want this to be a string. So that was the scenario of an example I was trying to show. But when you just very clearly define hello world, it infers, okay, that's a string. It's always going to be a string, the end. Maybe if I did let, maybe if I say, hey, this could change. No, because it knows it doesn't. So that's part of the static analysis where at least it helps anyways. So now we've got a, a slightly more generic version of hello world. We're, we'll keep it like this. Hey, why not? Actually, this part I don't need really. It's not part of the example that mattered. So we've, we've changed. Actually, do we need to change that though? It didn't really help with the example. So let's not change that piece that was the code originally let's just keep it the way it was let's not add any any more monkey wrenches or whatever so have we added typescript are we done with typescript i think we are i think we are let's see here uh yeah so let's just see what we've changed we got that file we got the json we've renamed the two files we've added the typescript definition I think we're we're good enough to say, and, and we know it runs, right? So let's say, added TypeScript support, and 
another commit there. I think it's time we can push these commits too. It's not really relevant, but now I'm worried my computer will crash and we'll have to do all this again. Uh, so we have a few more things we can discuss. Um, maybe we should break it up a bit here. I don't know who else is still watching, but just does anyone have any questions with uh, how far we've gone so far? I'd be interested. So if, if anyone has any, any questions, comments, or anything, or feels like uh, things are moving at a snail's pace, please tell me. We're already in our second hour, so it's pretty good, actually. I've been talking for a long time, it seems like. I think we'll probably just do another half an hour, but we'll see. I, I want to get through the linting part of things. Uh, and then good so far, but might be good to break it up at some point. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I've only got a little bit of linting left to talk about, but maybe we could, maybe we could even leave the linting for another, for another talk, perhaps. Um, let's at least talk about what the next stream will have. Actually, you know, let's get through the linting. Let's get through the linting because it's important. It's basic. Uh, I think, I think we can get through it, you know? in a reasonable amount of time. And, and if, if someone has to, if you guys want to leave and come back later or leave and check out the stream later to see see the, the final version, it's not going to change much at this point. I'm just kind of adding some linting, but uh, but but yeah, if, if let's just go through it and see how it feels, right? That, that sounds weird. Sorry, guys. Um, so yeah, ES lint. Let's just, so linting. I, boy, we could start talking about linting for a while. Let's, I guess we could get on a, a tangent with linting a little bit in that linting is kind of like static analysis. I mean, it is a, as a type of static analysis, I guess, in that it's uh, checking your code. And the goal of it is just to catch errors again, and it's to also have consistency with your code. Uh, does, that doesn't have to be the goal, but learning a couple new things probably does help that I already know some of it though. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I'm, I'm not expecting everybody's gonna be finding super new stuff here. I think that this stream could be useful too for other people that wanna set up a new project even just separate from what we're doing. So so I I apologize if at some points it almost seems too basic, but but I did want to kind of drive the point home during this first stream to just kind of focus on on just getting it set up, you know, and just goals and stuff like that. So hopefully there's something to learn. And, and yeah, like I think something you can take from what we're doing here too is just that all of this tooling is important, you know, and before rubber hits the road and you start coding, it's like, let's get our base. Let's, let's have the ability to do all these things and let's have all these checks in place so that when we start coding we can code faster and we don't have to worry about that and we don't have to go back later and refactor a bunch of stuff because uh, i mean we're already doing a complete refactor now so let's not give ourselves extra work more so but getting into linting yeah i mean there's tons of rules you can do with it let's just jump right into it in fact so we're in here's the es lint here find and fix problems in your javascript code fair enough uh that's basically all it does it'll scan through your code and find flaws Pro properly setting up a project isn't something I've done right in very many of my projects. As you said, the base is important. Good to go over it. Thank you very much, uh, Meowster Chief, uh, Aaron. Uh, I don't know if that's giving away anything, calling you Aaron, sorry. Um, totally right, yeah. And that's something I kind of thought was important, you know? That's why it's like, it's silly because my project is so far beyond that, that, that we're just talking about setting up Next.js, but... I think we should just do it over again because when I posted the, this project on Reddit, there were, there was a lot of people that were like, how'd you do it? And, and what'd you use? And, uh, how'd you start? And that kind of stuff. So it'd be interesting to, yeah, it'd be interesting to know, uh, to know if those people would get something from this. So I'm hoping they will. So getting onto the linting, you're going to want that linting. Yeah, exactly. My, uh, Kevin here saying you have to, you have to lay the concrete for the basement before you can frame the house. Yeah. And, and I think this also gives you guys an understanding for the tools because sometimes sometimes the tools are there and no one uses them because you don't know what they're there for. Or you're getting errors and you you start turning stuff off, you know? That's something I used to do back in the day with ES with linting rules and TypeScript is just start turning stuff off using, this is an any, that's an any, I'll get back to it later. And you never do get back to any of that stuff, you know? And it hurts you in the end and, it, and you waste more time by not doing it right the first time. And And that's something I want to avoid with this project as much as possible. So linting good, let's install. Here's the command. Let's jump to it. Terminal, boom. It's as simple as running that. Let's, again, it's a save dev. So this is a dev dependency. We don't need linting to be part of the front end. This is just something we do in the back end to the back end in quotes, the, the generation side. Uh, 
and we'll get more into some of the other aspects of where why, where Next.js is cool and about how it generates and how this Next.js dev next uh, dev works and everything. But we don't need to get into that right now because it's it's trivial at this point. Yeah, that, it's just a Hello World app right now, so we don't need to talk about performance or anything like that right now. So we got Lint installed. That was easy. Uh, first thing we want to do is do an init. I would say. I don't know if you need this npx command. I don't see why you do. Let's say you do. Okay. So we want to do an init just like we did with npm because we want to file. Uh, we've so far all we do is have the dev dependency. That's the only change we got so far. Oh, my console crashed. That's weird. All right. Let's do that again. So we want to do an init. So this is going to tell us what to do. It's going to work us walk us through the steps, and I'd like to walk through the steps a couple times. Kind of silly, but I, I just want to see what different steps give us and see if we can kind of combine it maybe. So let's see, to check. So what do we want to use it for? To check syntax, check syntax and five pro find problems, or to syntax problems and enforce code style. Yeah, we want all of that. Uh, we use imports and exports. You've seen them already, JavaScript modules. We, I mean, if you don't know that, you can, it, just by the brackets, import, export, those are the, the commands we use, so. Uh, its framework is React. Does your project use TypeScript? Yes, it does. Where does your code run? Um, I would say it partially runs in the browser as well, just because of the way Next.js, uh, sorry, Node as well, because of the way Next.js works and the way the backend generation works, static site generation. So I'm gonna check both. So they're both checked. I don't, uh, I think it makes sense to do both. Uh, so here we go. How would you like to define a style for your project? project? This is interesting because there's different people that do different style guides. There's Airbnb, there's Google, there's, um, I think Facebook has one as well. So there's a lot of different opinions about how to do the style guide. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go with a popular, so there's three other options here. There's two other options, answer questions about your style or inspect your JavaScript files. We're not gonna do inspect the files because we don't have anything in the files. It's gonna be pointless. Let's try answer the questions first and see what that gets us. And then we'll try a popular style guide. So what format do you want your config file to be in? Um, whenever possible, I prefer to do the JSON config files because those are static and it's just less to think about. Uh, you can do a, a config file that's a JavaScript file, which basically it just means the file can be a little bit dynamic. So when you're, um, it's hard to go over. Let's make the JSON file and then we'll, I'll show you how it could be dynamic if it was a JavaScript file. Indentation style, spaces. Uh, quotes, I'm a single quotes guy myself whenever possible. So let's do single quotes. Line endings. I guess I'm using Windows line endings. Um, probably not. I don't know. I always forget the answer to this question. Let's just say Windows for now. I'm on Windows. Do you require semicolons? Yes. Give me your semicolons, please. I love the semicolons. I, I just like to be even explicit with my line endings, you know? I know back in the day when you used to generate it used to be that you couldn't do that or, or that there, there were certain scenarios where not having semicolons could bite you. But I think Webpack solved that long ago, probably. I, I'm just, I prefer it, you know? So we did an yes to land. What did we get? Let's look at this file with some of this stuff out of the way here. Uh, close that. Let's just open the ESLint file as it is. We don't need to see a diff. There's nothing changed. So here's the file that's generated for us based on those answers. So we got our TypeScript. So, so it, it's just another config file. So an example here, how it could have been dynamic. If it were a JavaScript file, you could do some stuff ahead of time here to like, you could pull things, uh, let's say const. I don't know why the hell you would do this, but I mean, yeah, I don't know why the hell you would do this, but you could something like that and then have like that in here. I mean, you could, you could just treat it more JavaScripty. Essentially, you can't do that when it's a JSON file, but that's perfectly fine because we want to, there shouldn't be, I don't feel like there needs to be anything dynamic here. So we got our, our three environments, ES 2021 browser, ES 2021, I guess is like ES next, I suppose, or, or maybe there is an ES 2021. Uh, I don't know if you can do ES next here. Hard to say. Uh, we got our extensions. We got that we're using React. We got TypeScript. We got our parser. A lot of this stuff is, is how we want it. The, the rules here, see, I don't like this at all, the rules. So this is where it asked, asked us those questions, but I don't want to be explicit with my rules. I want to use a style guide that's existing. So I'm going to remove the rules. Otherwise, I'm going to take that. Okay, that was good. Thank you for that file. I'm going to delete it. And I'm going to do the exact init again, but this time with the recommended style guide. 
just to see if it changes anything relevant. Just, just to, just for the hell of it here. It's going to be a lot of the same answers. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Popular style guide. So I did some searching, and from what I've seen, Airbnb is the, the popular one. I mean, you think something called standard would be better, or Google, rather than an Airbnb. It's like Airbnb? What are they doing? JavaScript uh, linting guides? What? But I don't know. They, they got ahead of it, and they made a good one. So I would just use them. I'm going to. Uh, everything else stays the same, so... Would you like to install them now? So now, see, this is good. See, now it's getting all these peer dependencies. We want these. So this is essentially the Airbnb guide has a lot of other stuff it checks, a lot of other plugins that are part of ESLint. And and preferably we want those, I would say. I just wanted to do it the other way first to make sure we don't miss anything. But let's see here. So, and some of the plugins it's going to add, well, we'll see here in a second, but there's some cool ones anyways. So let's see what it added here. Let's check our package file. So you see it's added a lot. So it's added the Airbnb config. It's also added the, the plugin import tool to allow ESLint plugins. And it's added this A11Y. And what A11Y is, is accessibility, essentially. This is just a little abbreviation for the word accessibility. Uh, there you go, accessibility, just like that. Same with another fancy one is I18N. That's just a long, that's just a shortcut for the word internationalization. So that's what you can think of for those. And these linting rules are going to help you when you're writing your JSX to, to consider uh, accessibility, you know, such as if you have a click event, it, it'll tell, it'll give you a warning saying, hey, you know, you should have a keyboard event too, because some people don't use the mouse or can't see. So it just gives you all these useful considerations and you can turn them into warnings, you can turn them off. But I like to start with everything on and just be like, okay, I'm going to try to do it as good as possible. So it added React. And React Hooks as well. React Hooks is another useful one to, uh, to to monitor our hook rules for React, just to make sure we're using it correctly. Uh, and let's check it's and let's check the lint file now that it made, and let's see if it's any different. So it's got the React recommended, it's got the TypeScript, and it just has Airbnb here. So it didn't do an extend of this. This is something that's always confused me with ESLint is how many extends to use and what overlaps. So my thinking here would be, because they asked me about TypeScript and they put it here. So this Airbnb maybe includes TypeScript. I don't think it does, but they've decided to not add that extension even though they had it here. Same with ESLint recommended. They haven't put that in there too. So I personally just like to dump these in here. Like, hey, why not have this one too? You know, hey, why not have that one? And let's alphabetic, let's, let's alphabetize these while we're at it. Uh, so yeah, same with that one. Like, I think it might be superfluous or whatever, but I would rather have them. I guess this at symbol would be above this. Argument. That's the, let's say not. So let's put those in there because why not? Otherwise, it looks like it's pretty much the exact same thing. I'm looking for differences, not seeing any. It's got the same plugins. Yeah, so it's weird that it didn't do those same extensions. It's also made an empty rules. Sure, why not? I, uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt to have it, have it be empty. So there we go. So now we've got an ES lens and we've kind of combined the best of both worlds with this extends, but maybe we never needed it because maybe Airbnb is doing this and that. I don't know, but uh, on mine that I have uh, for X currently, I actually have a lot. I have more, but I'm not going to add those now because I don't know yet if we need those. Yeah, I have a bunch here. Like I have an Airbnb TypeScript one an Airbnb hooks one, but I also have a React hooks one, I think. I don't even have the React hooks one here. So it's it's not clear to me what all needs to be extended. I, I kind of went overboard there, but that might be that might be relevant, you know, it might be good. Well, that'll be for another video. That'll be an uh, addendum or something. So there's the ESLint. We did it. So what does that get us? Uh, let's check, let's test ESLint and make sure it works. So what about something simple like adding two of these? So you see that has not complained. Why is that? That is because that is a good question. An expectation I would have would be that that would show in the IDE as bad if ESLint were working. Oh, ESLint had a problem loading. What happened? No such file or directory. Well, I disagree. This is one of those things that happens sometimes with ESLint where it's, oh, whoa, whoa. 
Was it was it working now? Okay, there we go. Good, good. So it was just being stubborn, but it's working now. You know, sometimes you just gotta wait. So it's got some complaints here. Uh, what's complaint number one? Unable to resolve path. Import no unresolved. So this is something, this is an Next.js uh, thing where we do have to add some excluding rules so that Next.js plays nice. I, th I think this might be documented somewhere, but basically if you, if you know, if it's not documented, just start turning these rules off because the no unresolved, it, it doesn't know what's resolved because Next.js with Webpack is actually doing the resolving of that. So it's just wrong in this case. And I've got, I've got that here somewhere, I believe unresolved. Oh no, maybe that's here. Oh yeah. I need the import resolver. This is something we could even double check here. Let's, let's do that. Oh. Let's Google just to, just to learn how, how to do some Googling too here. So, oh, sorry, just going back here to the code. So I just hovered over it again and I copied. So here's the, it tells you what rule you've broken here and you can click this actually. And it, where did it go? I don't know where it opened, but it opened somewhere on my computer, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that opened. Oh, okay. It opened here. Let's move that over to this window here. So it's saying no one resolved. So if we copy that and we say, okay, why, why would it be doing no one resolved for Next.js? Because I thought Next.js was resolving stuff. So let's just do that. And we see right away, there's an ESLint import resolver for Webpack. And if we take a peek at that, it looks like this was essentially solved by doing exactly what I have done in the code, which was this. So let's go back to my code and see. So I did this, something similar to this, I guess. Hmm. Trying to find exactly where I, where I did that import TypeScript. Is that not what I have in this? Here's where it can be fun playing with the tooling too. This is the first problem I run into. ESLint parser. Okay. So there is, so it's not doing the import tool. Okay. So ESLint needs to know that TypeScript import works, I think. Let's, let's quickly, let's work back from the code that works to try to figure out why that doesn't work. Uh, let's just copy the ESLint rule and then find who explains why that rule needs to exist. Here we go. Oh wait, so we already have plugin import. You know, let's look at my code to see where I got that from. So yeah, this is where it can be tricky with ESLint because it doesn't always play nice. So here we go, import resolver. This is the package here. Let's let's see why this needs to exist. This plugin add TypeScript support to ESLint plugin import. Oh, okay, okay. Fair enough. I feel like that's something the ESLint init should have done, especially when it asked me if I need TypeScript. Or I wonder if that's related to, ex to my extension stuff that I added here. Could it be? Let's cut that out and use the recommended one for a second just to see if that stops that error. Not particularly, no. Still the exact same complaint. So let's bring that back. Those were, those were cool. And let's just do what it says here to do. So the installation is as simple as getting those two files. And we run that. Oh, you need that little N in front for NPM. And while it's installing, we'll just go back and see. Yeah, so here it explains, here it explains. So essentially it's a stripped down version of this. Add the following to your ESLint config. Import no unresolved error. No, I don't need that. Plugins import, that's already part of it, I believe. Hmm, plugins import. Did I have that with my original code? Sometimes you don't trust these con these configs where it's like, oh, you have to add plugins import. It's like, do I? Looks, no, I don't actually. So, and let's just copy what, well, let's copy their, let's, let's get their example again and see. So it's in the settings here. And let's just see what we need to whittle down to actually make this work. So we've got the settings. Let's bring it over to here. Boy, that looks repetitive. So we move that, close this. So there's a lot here you don't need. And let's, and if we compare that to what I wrote, it's very, yeah, it's just the import parser. We don't even need this, I don't think. Well, we only want to import those, parse those files. So that's actually a legitimate 
config. I don't know why I didn't have that. Uh, and then we got import resolver TypeScript. Yeah, basically, and it can just be empty. I don't need to put this. Yeah, we don't need any of that. Use a, These are all like different ways you can specify that. So that's essentially what I had before. I also had this little piece here, but we're not going to... Or I didn't have this piece. But the example suggests we keep it. So let's just try to keep with the example. So let's see how that helped. There we go. The error is gone. The squiggly line is gone. So that was useful. Linting is probably working. And now if we see here, if we hover over that extra semicolon I added, it does indeed say, wait, what is it complaining about? Missing white space after semicolon. Oh, okay. It's thinking this is another new line. So it is giving us an error, but the error is kind of cryptic. Uh, it would have been better if I did something like that, perhaps. There we go. It hates that. Yeah. Anyways, that's ESLint. So if we if we so I fixed that and we're still gonna have ESLint error. So what's the next one? JSX props, no spreading. This is another one. They don't another rule where Air, the Airbnb guide would suggest you don't use that. Prop spreading is essentially this. This triple dot thing is saying take this entire object and dump it into this component, basically. Dump its its values. And I like this. We use this. This is the default Next.js setup. So we, we, we actually want that. So I'm going to attempt to copy this tooltip. Oh, it's not easy to copy these tooltips sometimes. Copy that tooltips. Oh my God. One more time here. I'm going to copy there. I got some tooltip action there. I got some words that I could use. So the part that I care about is here. That was the rule. So all we have to do is take this rule. And if we go into our rules, we can just turn it off. And now that rule should not be an issue anymore, would be the thinking. Yeah, exactly. It's gone. There's there's other errors, so we haven't fixed all the errors, but it no longer cares about prop spreading. So we've resolved that. Uh, JSX not allowed in files with TSX extension. This is a silly error. Uh, we absolutely want this. So I'm going to copy code that our... We'll, we'll do it here. Let's do it. So we see, again, it's complaining. It's telling us uh, where to go. If we click that link, we can go to that page and see how it suggests we resolve this. Uh, basically, to resolve it, we need to specify like something like this. So we'll copy the rule here. We'll go back to our code, and we'll copy that rule just as it is. And we'll make it alphabetical. So actually, it should be before this one. And yeah, essentially, we'll, we'll, but what we want here is we want to say the TSX extension. That's the only one that's going to have any kind of JSX because all of our JSX is going to be written in TypeScript TSX files. So that again should should stop that complaint. And now we're down to one error. React in JSX scope. React must be in the scope. This is another thing. This actually isn't necessary with create React React app either. Is that it wants us to define React because it's seen things here that are React specific libraries and Next.js is doing some secret stuff to slip that in but ESLint doesn't know about that. This one's an easy one to solve. It's basically the exact same rule. React, React, and, uh, no, actually for this one, the easiest way to resolve it is just say that React is global. So all we have to do for that is essentially add global here as, as there's a, see there, this is autocomplete too. It'll tell us what we want to, what we can add. So we know we want globals and we know we want the global to be called React. And I think we say true. Let me just double check back with what I had in my original code to see if it's that that kind of thing. Yeah, basically. But actually with globals, you can specify other stuff. Let's let's dig into it to see. Let's let's quickly just go ESLint globals and see what, what is it. So specifying globals. So you see here, actually, so the options are writable or read only, it looks like. And the global will basically say that globally this exists. So don't cause an error if we're trying to use React, basically. So we're going to make this global React. We're going to say it's read-only because we're not going to be doing any modifying of that. And so we save that. And if we go, we're finally done with errors here on that one line. And this is the beauty of linting, you know? Now we have all these little problems to deal with. Uh, so here's another one. Unnecessary semicolon. That I agree with. That's that's correct. We that we don't need that semicolon. So thank you. It helped me more. Less less code. And now what's left? Explicit module boundary types. Missing return type. Okay, good. Another. This is almost a TypeScript one. Honestly, it. I mean, it is from the TypeScript rules. 
because we haven't specified what this function type is, what it will expect it to return. It's expected to return a component. So what we can do here, we can kind of hover over it and see, well, sometimes you can know what it's gonna return. Sometimes you kind of have to figure it out. Typically when you write a function, you're gonna know what it returns. This function was written for us. So I, it's a little harder to say what the component would be. Uh, it's something very common. I can't remember the name of it right now. We could look it up. I'm just gonna look at what I wrote last time, just as a spoiler alert to tell us kind of ahead of time what it is. It's like a React component. It's like something extremely basic. Yeah, React element, sorry. So we can specify that type as well. Let's take that in to our code and let's specify React element. And we'll say that what this is returning is the React element. And now we have no more errors in the code. And it took some time, but that's, that's good. And now what we can do is we can make a little command like our npm run commands so that we can do linting. We can do npm run and we'll say eslint. And when we run that, right now it's gonna do nothing. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a script to do that. We're gonna call it eslint. And we're gonna say what it does is it runs the eslint command. And it's gonna run on the main folder first. And this isn't ideal, I'm gonna change this, but I wanna just see if this does anything useful. So now when we run it, now we go, we got eslint dot. And it's probably gonna to try to run on the node modules or a bunch of other stuff. Um, what did it run on? Actually, it ran on pretty valid stuff there. Maybe that worked this time. I've had problems with this in the past where it didn't nest the way I wanted and it didn't pick up files, but let's go with that until it work, until it doesn't work, you know? And let's quickly peek at what I wrote in the other one, just to say, just to show you what I was, my expectation for how difficult it might've been. Uh, yeah, if we go into package here. So for eslint, I basically just explicitly set each folder. So the components folder, the context, the folders basically, and, and these extensions within the root folder. But it seems to be picking those up pretty pretty fine with just a dot right now. So if that's gonna work, great. So let's see what errors it came up with. So we ran the eslint command, like so, and it looks like it came up with quite a few errors. So it has a problem with our, with the line breaks. Oh, interesting, okay, that's an easy one to fix. Um, and there's also a trailing comma in the config file. Let's double check that, let's see if that's right. Where is this trailing comma? Oh, this it's another unnecessary missing trailing comma. Oh, I hate trailing commas. Okay, this is another thing I wanted to disable. Uh, comma dangle. Comma dangle is essentially, when they make these objects, they want you to end every object with a comma so that if you add another line like that, you don't also have to change this line to add the comma. So that's my thinking as to why that, why that they do that. Uh, I mean, that's a reasoning behind it at least, but I don't like it, you know, for some reason. That's just another weird one on me. So I'm actually gonna change that rule as well for our project. And uh, we can fight about that later. I'm gonna fix it in Prettier later on. There's an, I have another tool for doing styling that we'll add, but for now, I just wanna disable that rule because I don't like it. So comma dangle is off. Don't you worry about comma dangle. So now if we rerun, I haven't changed anything here, relevance. So if we re rerun the linting command to see what how it looks now. Okay, so we have less errors. It, it actually, oh, when I saved it, as you, you see how all the line breaks are fixed now? Because when I resaved this file, I believe editor config properly fixed the line endings is my thinking. So, or did it? It either fixed them or it broke them worse, but it changed them anyways. And I'm about to do the same to this next JS, this other file here. I'm just gonna save it. And that fixed the line endings. And now if we run ESLint again, we should be have very few errors. Yeah, so now all we got is a warning that says missing return type on function, on the index function? Ah, it's the exact same problem as the app one in that we need the react element here. So exactly the same thing. We just need to say the home function returns a react element. Same exact thing. So now if we run eslint on the project, we should get no results, which is good. No news is good news. So there we go. So now we have a script to do linting. And in a future future video, I'm gonna show you how to have this linting command run automatically as well, not just in the IDE. Uh, and also one thing I kind of glossed over is all the, when we were seeing all those squiggly lines in the IDE, that's because we have an extension in VS Code 
to properly interpret what the ESLint rules are. And to add that, you just go into your extensions here in VS Code and you type in ESLint and you'll see it here and you can install it just like that as an extension. And if you use a different editor, a lot of them support ESLint, so you're gonna have to look at, at the different ones there. Um, okay, so let's let's see where we are now because I think we've we finished with Lint, ESLint finally, believe it or not. Uh, and we're only at two and a half hours. So we got ESLint now. Let's review what we got. We got the config file. We've already discussed that enough. We got our few custom rules, plus it's Airbnb. Uh, we had to fix the line endings here. Uh, we fixed the, the line endings there as well, and we didn't allow comma dangle. Uh, we've added a, a linting script, uh, script command, and we've also added all these dependencies that were required. We've fixed the things that lint found, the, the unnecessary semicolon, the undefined return type. That was it. Uh, same here, the undefined return type. So we're set. So we've uh, added yes, lint support, essentially, and we're ready to do that commit. I think we've tested it enough. Um, so we have two more things I'd like to go over, Stylent and Prettier. Stylent is pretty easy. It's probably going to be a three-hour podcast, at least, or stream, whatever you call this. So bear with me. Probably longer than three hours if we start talking about stuff after, if anyone wants to. Uh, or if anyone wants to throw a question in, feel free. But for now, let's just move on to Stylent and see how Stylent works. So Stylent is essentially the same idea as ESLint, but it's for the styles. Uh, it works for SCSS, it works for CSS, and it will work for style components, but we will get to that when we add style components. Uh, because I've never done that before, so that'll be a whole other thing. So uh, let's set up Stylent. It should be another easy one. Let's say get, get started. It's going to be another one of those npm install commands. Again, here it is, npm install, and it's got the standard rules. Uh, I'm actually just right out of the gate going to not use these, and I'm going to use recommended, because I think that's actually better. Uh, I think they say that somewhere. I don't know where they say that, but let's see. Configuration. They talk about recommended. Let's search the word recommended. Uh, here we go. Extends. When they talk about how to use extends. So here's recommended. Turns on just possible error rules, whereas standard extends recommended one by... Oh, okay. Standard's actually better. So, so they actually recommend the standard one. But there's one called recommended too. Okay. All right. So maybe I was using the less good one before, I guess, because I was probably used recommended thinking that was the recommended one. Um, so let's switch back to the code and install this too. Again, save dev. We don't need these things on the front end. So we're saving them. Biggity boom. It's almost done. And I don't have any extras for this one. This one's pretty easy. Uh, while it's installing, let's just look at my style and config for my original project just to get an idea for how basic that one was. I think that one was extremely basic. Uh, where is that? That'll be style and rules. Yeah, pretty basic. I don't even know if there's an init command for style and there might be. Um, but it's as simple as this. They explain it right here. We just need to make this JSON file. So if we go back to the code, it's installed that. We got our change from our packages again and our lock file. And now we're going to go in and we're going to create that file that it suggested. Again, JSON format. We like our configs as JSON when possible. And we'll copy that code that they suggested here. This extends like so. Save that. Move back over to my code. And, and what, did, what did my original one look like? Just to compare. What did I have different? Oh, okay. So I had this. Yeah, this is a weird thing with style length where it because these are SCSS like uh, decorators kind of the at include at mix in, which they're calling these at unknown rules. This I don't like. This is an annoying part of Stylent that I, I currently don't have a solution to. Is that it doesn't like some of the SCSS decorators. So you just have to explicitly ignore those. We're not going to do that right now because we're not using them yet. When we need include or mix in, then we'll work on fixing Stylent if we even need to. Maybe we won't with style components. Who knows? So, so that one's really easy. That's done basically. And as you see, I used recommended before, but now I'm gonna switch to standard. So uh, we'd like to add a command now for it as well. So let's add another command to, to, to use it. And I think it's the same exact syntax actually of a dot. Let's see how far a dot gets us again. So I do that and then I should be able to test it right here. 
and we'll see what kind of kind of thing we get. We might not. Oh, so we got a lot. So what is it complaining about? Oh, that's weird. Oh, you have to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'd like to check the CSS files only, please. I mean, that seems so obvious, but I feel like ESLint knew that, but Stylent does not. Let's just see what I did here with the other one uh, for my command, for my, my Stylent command. I guess I had to be explicit. No, not specifically. I was explicit to the folder, but it doesn't care about file extensions. And if we look at what they recommend, I don't know if they recommend that. Oh yeah, they do say just specify file extensions. We're not going to worry about that though, because if we're specifying the folder, it's like everything in that folder is a style. So let's just say styles. That's actually a good one. Actually, let's not. Let's do what they recommend because what if the styles folder's name changes, you know, who knows? Let's try this, but I want it to be SCSS. I'm not writing no CSS. Does that work? Let's see if that works. I just made that up. Uh, I don't know if that worked because I don't think there's a problem with our styles right now. Let's make a problem. Let's add two semicolons and see if it hates that. Hey, there we go. There's an error. And if we scroll up to it, yeah. Unexpected extra semicolon. So great. We have style linting now. And did we see that in the IDE? We did as well. And if you hover over it, you see that it's a style lint error. If you see the style lint piece here. So now we have style linting in our thing. And I don't know if that's also an extension. Let me check. Yeah, same story. You need a, you need the VS Code extension. So style lint, just like that. There it is. Oh, wait, what? Do I not have it installed? Hmm. Didn't it say I have it installed? I do have it installed. So I don't know why I searched style lint and didn't, didn't find what I wanted. Uh... Oh, that's weird. Well, it's somewhere. Why can I not find it? Maybe it only shows me things I don't have installed. So it's it's the Stylent that's version 0.5.1.0 with, I don't know how many downloads. It's, it's the right one, I think. So that's the one you'd want if you're also adding that to your IDE, your VS Code. So I fixed I fixed that linting rule. Again, Stylent and ESLint will be part of uh, what we add to to automation later so that you don't have to run these commands every time, but that one's done. So we have it, that's working. So now we have Stylent. And again, we can uh, review our changes and see what changed. We added the script command and the, and the two dependencies, and we added the config file, which is extremely simple. So we can say added Stylent support. There we go. And there's only one more thing I wanted to do on this stream because the other stuff is going to take way longer. And that is prettier. And prettier is another really good one. Prettier essentially is going to do a lot of formatting for you. Not all of it per se, but it's going to, ch just like that picture. There we go. There's a, a website where it's clear. See the picture when I refresh the page. You see how the code's messy? Now it's clean. What more do you need to know, really? Uh, here we're gonna run the command. They're also adding the save exact command, which I think suggests that they want very specific lock file dependencies that don't change. I could be wrong on that. Let's just run it the way that they suggest anyways. I don't wanna, I don't need to go deviate from that. So now we wanna install Prettier. And what Prettier, yeah, Prettier what it's gonna do is just gonna format stuff. Essentially ESLint was doing a little bit of that editor config. Several of these tools almost have overlapping purposes in this way in that they're all kind of looking out for you, you know? And that can actually be a problem that we're going to get into is the fact that there's a little bit of conflict sometimes uh, with e between ESLint and Prettier and uh, and that kind of thing. So we're going to do the next the next step here is it suggesting that we create a Prettier RC file. So let's do it. Uh, simple enough. Essentially, that's the Prettier config file. We're going to make it right there. Uh, and you don't have to make this, actually, only if you want to change some defaults. And in my case, I do want to change a couple things. Uh, let's go to the docs here. Uh, no, let's, yeah, let's go to the docs for prettier. And I just want to show you their docs are very simple, actually, as to what you can config. Ignoring code, where's the configs? Here we go, options. They don't have very many of them. And I only want to change a few. Uh, let's just go back to my, my old project again, because I, 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 I want to remember which ones I wanted to change. Because there, there's only a couple. Oops, that's the ignore file. Oh, that's another thing we'll get into. We need an ignore file. 
here we go prettier oh i actually used a js one here to totally sloppy on my part this, this is again we're finding mistakes i wanted all the configs to be json when possible and it is possible but i did not do that so here's the configs i wanted i wanted single quotes because i like single quotes and i i don't like the trailing comma same thing i'm trying to get rid of an eslint so you can see them in here. Let's say we want uh, the quotes. We want it to be a single quote. You basically, you can see them in the config. It's clear, clear what they need to be. I'm just going to copy them from here because I already have them written out. And I'm going to put those in my config file here that I hadn't made. So, oh yeah, this is JSON now. So this needs to be quotes. They're very picky with JSON and everything needs to be nice. No double quotes with JSON. So there we go. We got our prettier JSON config and we can also make another prettier command here. Same as the other ones, prettier. And I think it's just prettier, but let's actually double check how you run prettier because it probably should be easy, you'd think. Uh, and write. Oh, you can like change the files? Check. Check is like write, but only checks the files. Hmm. Well, I'm actually happy with it writing the files, honestly, because any errors it comes up with, I want you to fix those. So let's just go right to it being a right command. So we'll put that here and we'll say it's just like that. And we're gonna need an ignore file or else I don't know what it's gonna do. It's gonna do the node, node modules fo folder too probably. So we're gonna switch that. We're gonna go to the docs here and say integrating with linters, eslint config. Oh, sorry, this is before the ignore. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Let's do the ignore first, because I wanted to do the ignore first. It's simple. Same as git ignore. It's just making a file. Uh, oh, let's switch it back to this. So it's again making another file with a very similar name, and it's actually the same format. So I'm just going to copy git ignore. I want to ignore the exact same stuff. So uh, it's too bad I can't, it can't just use git ignore by default. Maybe it can. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Again, nice to be explicit. It is a little bit of excess files. When you see all these files, it gets a little, it's like, in some ways, this is all boilerplate. That's a little annoying. A lot of this could all be in one place, but this is the structure, you know? And and and, and if we go through it the way we have, you can kind of see how it's it's not so daunting, you know? And, and the files have purposes and they're pretty simple. So we've done a prettier ignore. We've done the config the way we want and it's gonna auto fix. Uh, let's switch this to check for a second because I want to see if it finds anything. I don't want to change anything because I'm going to make a commit to say we added prettier. Actually, to be honest, I want to add prettier and change anything that's wrong at the same time. So let's just do it with the change. So we run prettier. If we go to our change file so we can see if anything else changes when we run this. And let's see if anything changes. So it goes through the files. Looks like it changed some stuff. Here we go. So it changed some stuff. So let's see what it changed. So for ESLint, JSON file, it got rid of the new line. It prefers this to be on a single line. Oh, let's make this smaller, or bigger, I mean, sorry. Couldn't be much smaller. So there we go. It's starting to make some opinionated changes and I'm fine with that as long as it's consistent, you know? That's a beautiful, the beautiful part about it. The ignore file, we made that. Sure, the JSON file, we made that. This is the way we expect. It didn't need to change anything there. The readme file, I don't know what it did, but it must have done something because it's changed. Uh, okay, let's just leave it changed. Uh, same kind of change here. It just took everything off new lines. Sure, it makes it cleaner. It makes it less. I mean, why not? It looks nicer that way. And what did it do here? Oh, okay, this. let's go into that file to explain what it did here. So what it's done here is it's actually put some of this on a new line. And that's because one of the prettier rules is that the code can only be 80 characters, I believe, in length. And that rule can be changed. But I actually like it because it's another thing that makes me try to write smaller. And it also, you don't have code that's going off into the distance that you need to kind of scroll to look at. That's an important part of that. It's actually something, once we get super into having to be very clean, I almost want it 80 by 80 actually. Like prettier says 80 long. And I also only wanted 80 lines in a file. Now it doesn't, it doesn't enforce that right now, but I think that's a nice rule of thumb that every file is only 80 lines. Because then it makes you think, okay, well, what do I have to extract? You know, what doesn't need to be here? And I, I mean, if you can make a file that needs to be 80 lines without having, without being able to extract things out into other places, then I mean, it, I guess it's possible, but I, I think you probably need to look at that file and, and think like, why is this such a big file? So 
Uh, and in this case, I don't I don't like that it put on a new line because it, it feels unnecessary. Let's put let's let's see if we can cut this down. Let's get rid of the word my because we don't. This isn't relevant that it's named my app. Uh, it could just be called app. So let's let's see if we just call it app. Does that fit on eighty characters? Uh, exactly eighty characters. Uh, and the way I know that, by the way, is right here where it says coal. So it says eighty. So if I if I put a space, you see it's eighty one. So and actually, when you put a space, you can even see the prettier enforcement. Or wait a minute. No, that's sorry. Yeah, this is an ES lint rule saying no trailing spaces. Again, it's nice. It's catching things, but I I don't think I have anything in prettier. I think that's actually the next step is that we can add prettier rules to ES lint and then it'll tell us about them. But let's let's see one step at a time. So we've made this 80 lines. Now let's run prettier again and see if it doesn't change this this time. Because we don't want it to change that ideally. I'm happy with it being exactly 80 lines. Good, didn't need to change it this time. As you can see, it's stayed the same. So, so now we have our minimal amount of changes for prettier that it's fixed. And one other thing we wanted to add is that, yeah, here's where, let's see if there's a conflict at this point. So if I run npm eslint, does the, here's where the conflict happens is that prettier changes something that eslint will complain about. It's not happening here, I can see, because I don't have a conflicting rule, but they occur. So I want us to look into this play nice config that they have, which I already have gone past, I believe. Here we go. Integrating with linters. And they explain it here. It contains not only code, but quality rules, and those rules can conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Basically what I said, but not as eloquent. Probably more eloquent, to be honest. Um, ES lint config prettier. Turns off all the rules that are unnecessary or might conflict with prettier. Great. Uh, including comma dangle? That'd be nice. Maybe. I don't know if it includes comma dangle. Let's add it anyways. How do you install it? Can't be that hard. Here we go. Looks simple enough. So we want the ESLint prettier config because we've added prettier. I don't think StyleLint needs something like this because they're not, they're not dealing with the same files. Well, I guess in a way they are. But yes, I don't think StyleLint... Well, let's try npm run StyleLint. And also let's check, did this also have a suggestion for styling? Oh, it actually does. Maybe we should do the styling one too then, hey? Let's do the styling one at the same time. Actually, let's not do them at the same time because that's confusing as hell. So we're doing the ESLint one right now. What did we just run? We ran the config prettier. Uh, and oh man, I've completely skipped ahead to the point where I lost a part. What was the next command? What was the next command? Here we go. Installation. Uh, oh, extremely simple. Basically just adding extends to the config file. So uh, if we go into our ESLint file, close some of the stuff so you can see. So remember it made that change. We wanna make another change of adding prettier here and we'll do it alphabetically. So prettier, just like that. So now prettier is part of it and, and that is all it needs according to it. Uh, there's also some TypeScript ones you can add. Let's let's see if we don't need that. You know, I, I don't want to add things until we need them, but I, I do want to add this because at least this is the start of it. We, we do need at some point this will come up, you know. But the TypeScript one, maybe it never will come up. You never know. So did that work? Let's just make sure that didn't break ESLint. So it doesn't seem to have broken it or anything. Still works fine. So cool. So that's that's all that there was for that. And that should still work with Prettier. Prettier is not even involved in that configuration change. So there shouldn't be a problem. Let's do the style link one next. Same, same kind of command. And we'll just type it in here. And I think this one is talking, it's the same kind of thing with extends too, but it's a different extends. It's on the style link side, which I think we also have. Let's see in our silent config. I think we've done extensions. Yeah, we've already done an extends. Uh, okay, we need to turn this into an array. So it looks like extends can work as a single one or as an array. We're gonna turn this into an array because we need to. We wanna extend the standard config and also prettier. PQRS, oh, it goes here, alphabetically speaking. So there we go. 
Uh, and npm run style imp should also still not be broken, hopefully. Cool. And I'm just going to quickly sneak back into ESLint and see if I need this comma dangle rule anymore because prettier handles comma dangles. So if I don't need that rule anymore, that's just another rule we don't need. Cool. So yeah, I don't think we need the comma dangle rule as long as we're saying that it extends prettier. So th these two rules we still need, though. Those are Next.js related. Uh, okay, cool. So that is it for prettier. Uh, let's review what we got because we're almost at the end of this here. So we've added prettier to ESLint and we've run prettier on it. We got rid of comma dangle. We got an ignore file for prettier. We got a couple config settings that are deviating from the basic because are from the, 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 the standard because I, I prefer single quotes personally. We can change that later on. Not a, I mean, the beauty of prettier too is that if we decide we, we don't want that, it's very simple to just fix everything all at once with one command. Uh, and trailing commas, yeah, we've decided. I've decided we don't. We we want to not have trailing commas for now because I don't know. I've just gotten used to not having them, so I prefer it that way personally. It's, it's my opinion. Uh, we've added prettier to style end. We've added the prettier command, and it's going to just auto fix or auto write. Uh, for ESLint, we won't do auto fix because we want to know. Sometimes we don't want auto fix. Uh, we've added prettier where we need to there. Uh, somehow the readme changed. TS config changed slightly, and we had to reword this so that it fit on one line. So essentially, we're done there. Uh, so let's say added uh, support for prettier. Or what have I been doing? Added prettier support, maybe. OK, and we're going to push those commits as well that we had from the past. And we've literally done everything that I expected to do in the stream to set up, a, set up the project. So. It's not everything, but it's a lot. And I'll, I'll just I'll quickly go right into what, what we'll do next time before we talk about other stuff is, is these things. I want testing, so we need Jest uh, or something like Jest. We can discuss which is preferable there. And that's going to go further and further as we build more complicated tests because I, I do want to have some kind of automated browser testing. And that's a whole other battle that I haven't even gotten into with Jest. Uh, Husky slash lint staged. That's kind of just to, some stuff to allow pre-commits uh, hooks. So when before we send something off to GitHub, we can kind of run some linting ahead of time and not allow people to slip in bad code so that we're not wasting our time in PRs dealing with that stuff. Uh, styled components, as I've said, I need to add that and also the style and rules for it. And Storybook. I don't know if we'll do Storybook. I don't know anything about Storybook, barely, except that a lot of companies are using it now, and it seems interesting. It's essentially, um, if you're not familiar with that one, that, that's the one that people might be less familiar with because I think it's pretty new. Build Bulletproof UI components faster. Essentially, it's a, it's a way to kind of show off your components. And and it's more like if you're working with UI or UX, I think. That's why I'm trying to decide, do we need this in this project? It would be, I, I'm kind of imagining this kind of library, but like the start menu, the window, the, the close button and stuff. That's cool, that idea, especially if we're going to do themes. But, but is it necessary? You know, like who's going to use Storybook? Who needs that as far as our, our repo goes? So I'm not sure about that one. But that's it for what we'll do next. I mean, we could review what I've done here, but uh, we've done a lot. We can switch to, the, to our redo branch and, and look at the commits we have so far to kind of see... See, we've added pretty, or we've, I mean, let's go backwards. We've done our initial commit. We added Next.js. We got React strict. We added editor config. We got SAS. We got TypeScript. We got ESLint. We got Silent. We got prettier. And all along the way, we can kind of see what kind of, what had to change, what got added. So there's a lot of clarity there and a lot of uh, useful information for, for someone just setting up a project and, and just to clarify how we're doing it. But yeah. That's that's about what I wanted to do with this stream was to set this up and it took three hours it looks like about so wow that took a long time I I hope people got something from this uh, I really appreciate the people that have stayed this long or, or kind of came and went and uh, I hope other people can take a look at this stream when it's up and uh, I'm gonna make some videos of all this stuff and uh, I think it might be easy to edit to cut up a little bit because I, I kind of have these commits along the way so it's like there's the ESLint portion. There's the this portion. So that I'm going to try to do that as well.
Thanks, Kevin. Kevin says, good job. I appreciate it. Good, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really had a lot of fun doing this, actually. My, my throat's kind of getting rough. Uh, I was thinking in the future to maybe do like a really hardcore one, like a 10 hour session or something like that. So that might be something for another day, but I really had fun with this. I'm going to do another one next week, same time, 9 p.m. PST, Saturday. And I want us to go over some of this stuff. It's going to be a little slower one in some ways because I don't know the perfect way to set up Jest. I never even used Husky. Uh, I'm new to styled components. Uh, we need to have that storybook discussion. So it, that'll be, we're going to get into the learning stuff. We're going to get into more new stuff along the way. And we haven't even started doing anything yet. We haven't even made anything yet. So uh, as far as like first things I'd like to make, I'd like to uh, work on, the, on a task bar or something. I'd, I'd like to make a component as a proof of concept so that we can start doing the other things. But I mean, we need to go even further back, honestly, because I want to handle processes and stuff too. So we'll have to figure that out together next stream, what the next next stream will be. But but yeah, we'll get there. Separate commits felt like a pretty nice way to denote subject. Yeah. Thanks, Meowster. Yeah, hopefully it worked out. Hopefully it, this didn't feel all too tedious to you guys. And uh, I, I I would really appreciate criticism uh, constructive, ideally, but I'll take any in the comments, wherever you want to put it. I, I want these streams to be good. I want my videos to be useful. I want to be, uh, saying things in a way that people resonate with. Uh, I've seen a lot of videos where, where a lot is left unsaid or a lot of assumptions are made. And I don't want to be that kind of person where the person where, where they, they leave my video thinking, uh, he didn't explain what I wanted to explain, or he didn't really get into things. And, so I hope we can do more of that in the future. But anyways, it's been three hours. It's been nice. I, th I think it's, I think I should call it a night. And I really, again, I appreciate everyone showing up. And I, I think that's it. So, uh, so yeah, again, thank, thank you guys very much. Anyone that stayed as long as they did and anyone that wants to check it out later and uh, there's more to come. So I appreciate it all. Thank you guys. Bye.